That means I should smile. You should smile. Yeah, it says we're live now. That's a good sign. Right. Submarine uh, coffee mug. Yeah, but now I got to make sure that it's coming through, and that's I'm not seeing it, but there's supposed to be a lag, so we'll see what we get. Testing, testing, one, two, three. National Security Decision Making page. Yada yada yada. Why am I getting the feeling it's not working? Not working. It's telling me live. Well, it tells you live, but I'm looking at the Facebook page to see if our pictures are showing up because that's that's the key thing. Because uh -huh. I may have to do this another way. Let me see if I can get creative. Nick, Nick is in. Hi, Nick. How are you doing? I don't know if he's live here, but uh, he just responded on Facebook. It's working. You guys are live now. Thanks, oh, good. Nick. Excellent. That's what we were trying to double check. <laughs> Excellent, because it was all about making sure that it works. This is a new experiment. Hi, everybody. Hi, Chris. Good to hear from you. It's been a while. We're crossing our fingers. It's about success. Can you see? Let me see here if I do this right. Let me move back a step. So, bum, bum, bum. there we go. So, can you guys see the presentation as well? Can you see the presentation? We're waiting because there's a lag. Okay, I got a yes on that. That's good. Because this doesn't have two-way chat like Zoom, but it has other advantages because nobody has to load any software or do anything else. So that's all very good. And we're going to wait until six minutes from now to officially start. But we'll wave a lot. Wave, wave. Okay. <laughs> yes, there is a lag. There's also a lag on the YouTube stuff. And theoretically, we are broadcasting to YouTube successfully. So I'm going to check that real quick. Because this is our first experiment at new world of high tech and we're sort of semi tech so other than that we're fine excellent so we also should be live recording and light is good i noticed some of you had noticed that we now have a new nsdmg youtube channel which is good, and this should be the first item that shows up on it. And I'm not seeing it shine through yet, so that's kind of interesting. We'll have to see. If it doesn't record, the worst is we'll do this again sometime with better charts because we figured it would just be criminal if we didn't do it on the actual anniversary, so that's the story. And uh, let's see, we should pass the time by telling Dan jokes, right? I don't think I can do the that would be bad, that would be good Dan routine. Is anybody good at that? You know, we can send you an invite and put you on screen. <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm not seeing it go through. That is a sad statement. Let's see what it says here. I am live. I can view it on Facebook, but where the heck am I doing it? Well, okay. Well, we'll cross our fingers. So we're going to do that. There we go. Now we have the two of us in the presentation. How's that? And let's see if it tells us how many of us there are so far. I don't expect a huge turnout, but there will be some. I got three minutes to show time. I got six viewers. I got seven likes. That's all great.
And it looks like we are not successfully recording to YouTube. But that may just be the name of that tune. Let's see what we got here. One more check. Yeah, da, da, da. yeah, yeah, checking, checking. Aha! It's failing. Okay, that's all right. It just doesn't have to be the way that is. But at least we'll get to do this. I got two minutes to show time. Yeah, that's one of the things we like about StreamYard. StreamYard has some nice advantages, so we can do things like uh, when we really get fancy, we can do uh, nice little banners for who's speaking. Uh, eventually, we can do ticker tapes at the bottom. We can put our logo in the corner instead of the StreamYard logo when we do the pay version. And nobody has to download any software to make it work, so that's one of its advantages. So you guys can ask questions in the chat, and we'll try to keep up with questions in the chat. Um, the plan is basically we're going to go through a simple slide deck and talk about how NSDM started and how the kinds of things that we've been doing over the years. And it's sort of meant to be a coffee table, round table kind of thing. So you can insert questions at any time, and we'll try to answer them. And uh, we've got a two-hour block, so we'll go as long as people can stand it within the two hour block and then we'll move on. Uh, and this will be sort of the basis of some more advanced stuff we'll do later because one of our plans is to have a historical record of all the fun that NSTM has created. And uh, we've got bits and pieces of it in this presentation and other things we're putting together. And we may actually get a website again this year because I have a volunteer that has replicated the old one on WordPress so that it's not yet open to the public, but we're working on it. So we'll get to there. So we're now at 8 o'clock. So I'm going to let Mark take it off, and I'll, we'll walk through the slides. And Mark, you can tell me when you want me to shift, since I have added some visuals to your PowerPoint presentation. OK. Uh, as a, uh, you, as you, I'm sure you understand, NSTM is now 30 years old. This is the 30th anniversary. Uh, go ahead, Merle. Uh, we started out at, uh, at that point, Origins was a roving convention. It moved from year to year and uh, piggybacked on, as the national game convention, it piggybacked on top of some other large convention. So Origins was co-located uh, in uh, 1990 with Dragon Con in Atlanta. Uh, this was the cover, in fact. Uh, it opened up, so on the front cover, you just saw these typhoon-class submarine surface to the ice. We called it ice picking at the time. When you open it up, you saw that, that dragons were attacking them. Uh, Dan's joke to that, my brother Dan's joke to that was, I didn't see that, I'm seeing that in the budget. Uh, so we had been invited to uh, Dragon Con. Uh, actually, Dan, Dan had been invited to Dragon Con. At that point, they were trying to put together a presentation, Luzaki, uh, for um, uh, military gaming uh, as part of what ultimately would come out to be the Origins War College. Uh, but he had invited members, he invited members of the Air Force, Army, and Navy. And Dan was at that point the president of the, of the War Game Club, so he got tasked for it. Great, here you do this too. You don't get paid for it, but at least he got non uh, non pay orders. But he also offered, well, while we're at it, why don't I um, put together a demonstration game to show you what military gaming is like? So he drew up the plans for for um, uh, for the uh, National Security Decision Making game, play test, played test at once with a bunch of buddies up at the Naval War College, and invited me down to try to help help him run the game. So, so Mark, yeah, what was what was Lou's position with the convention? It wasn't entirely clear to me from the history um, whether he was like in charge of their speaking seminars or if he was like the people that were responsible for origins when it took the bid from Dragon Con to go do things there? How did that work? 
I don't know. I don't know if he had any official position. He was on Gamma, on the Gamma board. So I think this is just an initiative he had to say, let me put together this program. And everybody thought that would be a fine idea. It certainly wouldn't do any harm. It didn't cost them a whole lot. So uh, they just, uh, Ray, you know, he's, he's been a, a good uh, spokesman for us the whole time. But he brought us in not, not thinking at that point where it was going to go. Uh, so we came down and we gave a game at, I think we're probably up to the next, next slide, uh, gave, gave uh, he designed a game. He, uh, the game was supposed to be designed to explore decision-making processes within a nation structure. Uh, try to take what your requirements are, what your objectives are, uh, how you're going to orient your policy and budget toward that. So as such, it was really an internal game. Uh, and we, he put together a cell for the U.S. and a cell for the Soviet Union, which was a country back then, 1990. Remember, the Soviet Union was <clears throat> weak but hadn't dissolved yet. Um, and uh, a world map which used access and allies rules. The policy and budget sheets that were filled out, some of you old-timers might have seen policy and budget sheets. We haven't used them in a few years. But they actually were used to purchase units the way units are to be purchased in an access and allies game and place them on a stylized map. Was a, um, actually a polar projection that we put together that uh, emphasized the U.S. and Soviet aspect of it. Uh, and the uh, players would start, uh, start then moving out. Uh, the, we broke the teams up into the Soviet team, the U.S. team, and the green team. The green team, generally somebody had some other country, uh, and they were, and Dan said, you know, we'll make a crisis or two you know, every, every move or so, and a policy and budget cycle was a move. Uh, and uh, something that the U.S. and the Soviets had to react to. And after about halfway through the game, it was an eight-hour game, he had to ask them to tone it down because the, they're, they're putting the, um, uh, both, cell, both player cells into meltdown. And we, Dan and I turned our back, and they wiped out Iraq <clears throat> on their own without us. You know, just Turkey and Iran decided to get together and, and crush them. But that's what players do. We gave them rules. We gave them pieces. We gave them a combat system, and they wiped out Iraq. Great. Um, Tell you you can't tr turn your back at the players for a moment, but anyway. Uh, so uh, yeah, policy. I, I mentioned the policy and budget sheets were what we used to document the move. That's what the players internally, the Congress and the Politburo, uh, use their processes to come out to, to come up with. Uh, now I remember the times the Berlin Wall had uh, had just come down. The Soviet Union was decaying but wasn't gone. The, the U.S. military had been rebuilt. Uh, from the, the Vietnam days, uh, we had just gone through, uh, run over Grenada, run over Panama. We we're at the closing the end of 10 years of, of Reagan's eight years. Um, and uh, in fact, a lot of the players coming to an NSDM game in 1990 were sick of having their noses rubbed in the Vietnam thing for the last 15 years. So America was, American psyche was on a rebound, especially on the, the people who would be inclined to come to a war game convention. Uh, so they, I think that had a lot to do with with our initial success and why we why we caught on very well. Next slide. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> now Dan was wildly popular. Those of you who remember him know that he was a a very um, energetic speaker. He had uh, uh, a, gr a great presence and uh, excellent stories to tell. He was uh, very very fun. Uh, very funny, and he scheduled a lot of lectures on top of the one game we had scheduled for Thursday at Dragon Con. Um, I think it was Thursday. I guess it was Friday at Dragon Con. They're probably still doing Friday, Monday. But um, and the uh, by word of mouth, uh, the, the audience has kept getting, getting larger and larger. I, you know, we I could overhear people walking past. Hey, you got to come hear this guy. Get him listen to this guy. You know? So they got larger and larger. So the second game on. Uh, was backed by popular demand since the first one was so uh, so popular. It wasn't scheduled, but Dragon Con or its last origins scheduled another another second game, and uh, we put that on, and it was uh, was uh, quite a success. Um, so we came back with a few a few uh, items on what we needed to do, uh, where we needed to go with it, and uh, uh, moved and moved on into planning for there going to be next year. Now Desert Storm Desert Shield brought things to it things kind of a change. Go ahead, Merle. Okay, in 1991, Origins was in Baltimore, um, and uh, uh, Dan, in fact, was in the Middle East at that time. Uh, he was, it was after Desert Storm, but he, you know, he was, he was formal Navy. He was sent to um, um, uh, outpost of Guantanamo Bay, except they had been forwarded to uh, Bahrain. And his job 
was after the war to, to find shipping to package up all the, all the toys and send them home. There's a commander, Dave Cady, at the Naval War College had taken his job and running logist, you know, logistics simulations and gaming. And he, uh, I brought, actually brought him down to Groton where we ran a play test of one game. Uh, so he, he knew what it was. And he came back and he rewrote a lot of the rules. Not, not in any really good way, I don't think. But he kept, kept the same basic idea. It was still a board game, a still access and analyze rules stimulating gameplay. And, we, and uh, he gave some lectures at uh, Baltimore. He wasn't as skilled as Dan was. But what? But he kept he kept it alive, and he was all right. Next slide. 1992, Dan's back in country. Uh, Origins is co-located with Gen Con in Milwaukee at that point. Um, uh, we did lectures in NSDM games. At that point, we also met Matt Caffrey, who'd been, a, been become a close friend ever since, um, and we started started to run that uh, that routinely. Uh, so at that the, point, the, the convention to that story, Mark, because. Yes. Uh, apparently, Matt and Dan met in 1990 at Atlanta. There is a story. Hey, yes, yes, you're right. You're there's right. There's a story you, you, I was told by both Matt and uh, by Bill Lotteman that Bill and Matt and Dan were all in the same coffee shop talking about wargaming in Atlanta. And mm -hmm. when you think about it, now we have Matt as the author of On Wargaming and sort of the absent minded professor of connections that brought military and private commercial people together. And you've got Bill Lauderman as the chief of the uh, war fighting center down in Quantico. And then there was Dan and, and you, and it's like, I really feel like I'm in an August presence, but we'll go on. <laughs> yeah. We also met up with their first, first time we met with um, uh, Larry Bond uh, and uh, had a good time. You know, of course, Larry, Larry ended up being a Paul Bear, Bear at Dan's dance surfaces. Um, so uh, that's that's a, that was a bit of close so connection. So we made, made a lot of good. Then? I'm sorry, say again. Was Larry at CNA at the time you met him, or was he someplace La else? La Larry was an author. That's not, we're not talking Chris. We're talking Larry. Because his history was he went from um, active duty to working with CNA on an assignment as active, okay. to then um, working on. Uh, the book with Clancy because he was called in as an expert. Yes. And came by, that point, and right. by that point, he was done with that book, and I think he was uh, also into he, he was he had he had Harpoon out in print at that point. Yeah. Uh, so he's he's you know, at that point a, a bona fide professional war game designer. Yeah. As well as author, published author. Okay, so where are we? Uh, yeah, so we're we're going to origins at this point. Uh, at this point, we're we're realizing the Axis and Allies rules aren't working. The the um, uh, uh, players seem to seem to enjoy a much more free form thing. We can't really simulate the world using the Axis and Allies rules. I, you know, Dan Dan wasn't much of a person to put idea, you know, math together and mechanics and whatever. I, I looked at the rules in 1990 and said, you know. If they build fighter, the, by these rules, if they build fighters on move one, they're not going to get them to Europe by by the end of the game. <laughs> so it's you, we're you, we're we're putting together these things for people to to build units, but Dan it doesn't work. But uh, yeah, Dan, yeah, he he never listened. He listened to me, but usually I, only after uh, only as a last resort. Anyway, we're losing the axis and allies rules and and any real. A real sense of a move. The, the nations themselves still worked on the process of going through a policy and budget seat, budget uh, system as far as what their moves were. But at the same time, uh, background: the the world was running in real time with freeform combat operations. We used box that bunch of guys sitting around a table to determine what unit won. If the two units come together, who wins that battle? And uh, what are the losses? What are the implications? We and put out real maps, not the stylized you know, maps, waxes, and allies. So and in ninety four, in ninety four, what did a PMB look like? Did it look the same as it did in ninety five? Was the format yeah. of the PMBs established in like ninety three or ninety four? Yeah, I don't think the format of the PMB changed much. We we tweak on it a little bit here and there, but in in essence, it stayed the same. Um, you know, block, blocks to fill out uh, your budget and your pol your foreign foreign orientation, domestic orientation, um, and uh, the, the, those those things. Uh, so it didn't really didn't didn't really change much. Um, uh, we uh, now this, it, the, the public is still interested. At that point, we'd had the you know we're not talk, not talking 19, 
92 and through 94, we had a spectacularly successful Operation Desert Storm uh, that uh, you know a lot of people were really excited that we were able to to accomplish what we did with the at the relatively small cost we had. Not that uh, not that any any combat deaths were celebrating. Um, the Soviet Union has collapsed, and there's a new world order, and people are intrigued trying to figure out what's going to happen now without the bipolar system that we'd gotten used to for you know, since the end of, end of the Second World War. Um, ongoing Middle East problems, we, we have had, um, so, you know, had our, our, our you know, wrist, wrist slapped in Somalia, uh, the Balkans had showed us some of the limitations of power, um, and the change in U.S. power after you know, essentially 12 years of, of Reagan-Bush. Uh, now we're, now so the Democrats are back in charge, and uh, there, a, lot of, a lot of things kept people interested in this. Next, next slide. I was trying to answer a question. Give me a sec. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Origins 1995 is Philadelphia. It's the first first permanent first time we put together a permanent control staff. I was talking to Dan a few months ahead of time, and I said, "Hey, you know, we, we got some people. We got you know Jerry Smith. We got Carl Olson. They, they'd be interested in coming. Could we? You know, we could probably convince the, the hotels to give them give them hotel rooms." Um, and so we actually brought in a handful of people. For the first time, and that was our first permanent control staff. Um, and uh, Gen Con considered that a pinnacle event. My name was on the the front of the, the on-site book cover. I don't know why mine and not Dan's. I think because they saw he was lieutenant commander. I was a commander, um, though he was lieutenant commander on you know, retired active duty. I was so commander in the reserves, but yeah, that's that doesn't matter. But anyway, my name is on the on the book cover. I don't think anybody. Then you know, uh, you know I, I love to remember that. I'm not sure anybody really today and at Gen Con realizes how important they considered me back in 1995. Uh, but the promotions itself led to increasing crowds. Dan's lectures certainly helped, as popular as they remained. Um, the games uh, up to Gen Con, I think we had our, at that point registered our 82-person game at Milwaukee, and that would be our our peak for about uh, 20 years to come. Um, we would always be fighting an uphill fight trying to get back to those numbers again. At that point, we had the U.S., Russia, Japan, China sells some attempts at Europe. Uh, Dan would be rolling. You know, Dan was at that point the, the lead designer, and I was just I was content to be the person helping him. I'd give you know I'd help him out with a lecture now and then. Uh, I would be trying to take over the military control, when, and uh, ultimately evolving to economic control when uh, that became necessary. Um, numbers. I was doing numbers. I was doing background stuff. Um, but I was looking looking forward to seeing what, okay, Dan, what, and I think everybody, what, what country are you rolling out this year? What's going to be this year's? Our standard uh, became um, uh, to be, our standard convention was Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, eight-hour game. And that was it. Now, beyond that, we'd fill in with lectures. Um, let's go ahead. Next, next slide. Now, this one I thought you'd like because we found a, a, a picture from history. This is yes. 97. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there's 98 staff. That's not everybody in 98, but I think it's most of them. Mm -hmm. At that point, I'd given up. We'd both given up wearing uniforms. Dan, Dan I think, stopped wearing a uniform when I outranked him. <laughs> yeah, because you can see Mike and then uh, John Beatles and Don and Jerry and Wade. And then mm -hmm. you and Dan and uh, is that Pat in the middle, I think, between the two uh, of you? Yes, that's Pat. Okay. Pat All right. Okay. Now there are some uh, some things we always we've we've been fighting at as far as the philosophy and what we're trying to do, and we're still fighting with a lot of these now. Um, intercell versus intercell is the NSDM game about the internal politics within the country, uh, which it certainly is, and or is it intercell, which is how are these two countries getting along, and are they cooperating? Are they in conflict? Are is one making problems that the other needs to address then in their own policy making arena? Those are all true. I tell people that. NSDM is three games that we're trying to run simultaneously, or two games, uh, you know, three games we're trying to run. We have one cell, they're running their game, their decision-making structure, their, their, their moves, what they're, what they're doing. We have another cell doing the same thing with a different structure, a different set of uh, resources. And then we have the external game where we're trying to impose uh, uh, an, an external th world on them to make them think that they're actually in the same universe together. Uh, one actions are affecting the other and vice versa. Um, diplomacy versus military versus economic, uh, all aspects we try to bring out. Uh, a lot of, we've seen a lot of players come in, especially in gaming conventions. They say, okay, find, some, find me somebody to fight. 
it's supposed to be a game for, you know, let's build it, let's build our forces, let's knock somebody over. So, well, and I, as military controller, one of the first things I try to do is say, are there in fact diplomatic or economic options? Are there other uh, means you can, of pre, uh, putting pressure on this other country? Um, anyway, uh, military modeling has always been uh, difficult in this game. Um, because you know, first out, or we started out with the Axis and Allies rules, where you built a fighter, well, you built a fighter unit, and then you put it into combat, and you lost the fighter unit. Uh, I started to build something very spreadsheet based and technical, where you ma actually made a decision what units you wanted to raise and what you wanted to sustain, and at what levels, readiness and training, how much you're putting in, is it fully funded, is it quarter funded? All these having to do, and you shift a unit from active to reserve or backing in. All these things having to do with the players' decisions as to what their military requirements are, what their security requirements are, what they're willing to fund, what they're able to fund, and they can make compromises back and forth, and then deal with the consequences of those. It it worked. I thought it was good for its purpose, but it was a little too uh, uh, academic, a little too uh, for for a, for a lot of people. But for what it's worth, I, I put in a lot of work, and I thought I thought it was a pretty good model. Um, U.S. versus non-U.S. centric. It took it was until it wasn't until about 1998 or 99, eight or nine years in, before we ran a game that did not have the U.S. cell in it, and we have a lo an awful lot of people. One of our uh, best best early controllers, Walter Krub. He, when he was a player, he only wanted to play in the USL. He, he didn't want to go anywhere else but play in the USL, play in the USL. When it finally announced that, okay, our, our player cells are going to be Russia and Iran and China, I, I looked at him, <laughs> and and he his eyes glazed over, and he, he fell out of his chair. <laughs> Well, I can't get the U.S. Well, of course, at that point in him, Iran, that was that was a uh, – um, red herring game because Iran was actually a facilitator cell that we put him in. They, they were supposed to uh, moderate, start to build up their forces, and then have a radical revolution that the players would have to deal with. It would work very well, but we, you know, we, we used Walter very nicely as a facilitator in that, and he, he was fine with that job. Um, you want, listen to the comment. I'm just talking. If there are any questions here, you need me to rest them, I'll go ahead. Um, now, economic modeling, uh, we, all, all, we want it to the players, you know, Dan was conservative. Uh, you know, uh, he felt the only way to to raise your to improve your economy was lower taxes, lower taxes, lower taxes. Yes, it's it's a lot more than that. And if nothing else, we wanted to reward the players for trade deals and negotiations, figure what their economy needs, and try to get it while giving you know selling something that they have a, a plethora of. So we I I put together a a GDP growth spreadsheet uh, that I, yeah, I, st I still stand by it today, but it rewards uh, you for making it your tra yeah, trade deals for what you need, giving up what you what you have. And it also rewarded you for keeping taxes low. It rewarded you for keeping a sense of security and safety. Uh, if if you, you get start riots getting out, things like that, that those all bump down your GDP. And I thought it was I thought it was very good. And the trouble is, uh, without the policy and budget sheets, we haven't been using those for a few years. I'm not sure we'll ever go back. It doesn't really matter that much um, about what economic modeling does. It's enough for us to get up and say, and your economy did really well last year. Go ahead and we'll move on. Um, now, NSTM has always have been, had this uh, split personality between whether it's a role-playing game or a seminar advocacy, adv adv an advocacy seminar play. Uh, the advocacy seminar is how I refer to it when we say that you are the head of a cone. If you're the secretary of defense, for example, for example, you're the head of a defense department and you are arguing for them. Or if you are such and such a faction in uh, the Congress arguing for you know, this special interest, there's a cone behind you and that we tell, yeah, you can't assassinate people because if you bump off the player, we'll replace him with somebody who looks and sounds just like him. Um, whereas role playing uh, is if you were the Air Force chief of staff or the chief of naval operations, something happens and you order the units over and you're, yeah, it's, sure. If you get assassinated too, we replace you with somebody who looks this like, but you're not actually actually trying to advocate for a position, a policy and budget. You are giving orders to move things. And uh, some people like one, some people like the other. Uh, mixing them seems to work, but you need to make sure when you're designing the game, if you know what you're mixing. And you know what something is, and you identify it, and you you don't want to make it uh, um, uh, something that doesn't work very well. well. One of the problems I always had with Dan and his designs is he never had a problem 
with positions that I looked at, I glanced at and said, this is marginalized. He can't possibly achieve the goals you set out for him. Uh, and instead, he's going to spend the next eight hours beating his head against the wall, sometimes being uh, punished by the players, you know, the, the, the liberal, the Iranian liberals, for one thing. Yeah, yeah. who wants that role? Now, I've, people have done well in it, uh, but I'm not sure how much they enjoyed it. And Dan used the fact that people have done well in it. They're rare. They're few and far between as justification for why it's OK. Uh, it goes back to, to um, detail versus playability and how uh, much of how much you're modeling versus how much you're trying to make a game that could be enjoyable to all. And I've always tried to, Dan, Dan would usually come out with a new, a new cell and we'd run it and I'd make notes and then I'd go through it over the next year and I'd, I'd tweak on the motivations and I'd uh, make it so the players aren't all that marginalized and, and, and then I'd, I'd, I'd stick it back to him. I don't think you realize I'm fixing it, <laughs> but, but well, I, I, think, I think I fixed an awful lot of stuff that he never, uh, he never really did. Another piece of that whole thing is the, the battle between, in wargaming, the artist and the architect. And this is one of the things the professionals talk more about that, that commercial and private role players don't, because Dan was a consummate artist. He yeah. had a sense of what was fun, had a sense of what was imaginative, and had the creativity to come up with the concepts for like the Europa cell. And to come up the, with the concept that, oh, gee, we need to be able to play a, a game in, in two hours, not four or eight or or whatever but the challenge of that was he didn't always know how to implement it so he would open his mouth and we would have to deliver and that's really you know how we wound up with the four hour fast plays because it was like how, well i told how, the convention i'm going to do a four hour game and i have no idea how to do it and then Merle yeah, says, how we I end up i know how to do it but it's not going to be quite the same how we ended up with the cold war game too with there's another slide on that if coming up but uh yeah, yeah uh, uh, and among other things we uh uh, we we uh, I could put it in this as, as a line item: the death of the electorate. In the U.S. cell frequently, or at the, from the very start, had a series of electorate players, and they were players who wanted this, wanted this, wanted this, wanted a, se a series of things each differently, uh, and they had a number of votes, and they gave their votes to the politician that talked them into giving them their votes, and then the politician was the one who acted on the policy and budget. And, and made essentially made the moves. But the thing is, the trouble is the electorate then sat around for an hour and a half listening to the politicians talk and seeing who delivered and who didn't. Then they made their decision in probably in a matter of minutes, who who they give their, if they want to continue the, to give their votes, but they didn't. Yeah, it means there was nothing to do. They sat, just sat around and watched the gameplay. And after a few years, we managed to kill off the electorate saying that these positions are, are, are boring. Uh, people are are not are coming eight hours for you know, an eight, eight or a boring game. We started to have Camp Dan. Now Camp Dan was a spring workshop at Dan's house in Maryland, and we you know several of us would drive in from all over. I, Mike Tucker would fly down uh, from Toronto, uh, and we'd spend a long weekend at Dan's house. We'd go over the rules, every set of rules, every go through every cell, every motivation, and try to tweak on things and talk about the future. And it was at uh, the death of the electorate was uh, something we killed off at, at Camp Dan, I think, around 1997, 1998. Um, and I'm very careful. Every now and then, we I hear people discussing uh, the, some new game, new cell design, and and basically they'll take uh, some public public group and say, and they empower the politicians. Say, You're, we're going back, and it might be it might be a good model, uh, but it's not fun. Right. And sometimes you know, we try before that with the electorate, I tried giving them other things to do, like foreign policy. This electorate, I also made him a uh, um, this this uh, industrial icon who can go overseas and make deals with other countries. And and it, it, they were they were a way to make things work. But it was also schizophrenic. Whether you know you're you're representing the, the U.S. Northeast, but you're also representing these industries. Um, yeah, but it, for for what it's worth, we've, we've gotten away from that, and uh, I don't think we're ever going to be back. Well, um, we did so in, in one other environment, we tried to do that when we built the Indonesian cell originally, because we used the cultural groups that, that revolve around language to empower things, but we also let them in, basically propose legislation. They didn't have. Um, you know, an act in voting for it, but they could propose stuff. And we yeah. found that, that really was a problem too, because even though they had good agendas that were interesting, they had a hard time identifying if they'd achieved their goals. And they had long periods where 
people would give them lip service and they go, this, it really isn't fun because the battle there is, you know, we're trying to ensure that in every cell there's internal and external tension and that every position is fun to play because, you know, it's, it's like in the old days, you know, you go back to the mid nineties and you had terrorist number one, two, and three. And whenever terrorist number two came out, everybody went, Ooh, because they knew there was a terrorist number one. And because they're like, yeah, that was, Everybody that eats was, them up. Right, it was Jerry Jerry Smith's story. Oh, and I think I designed the cell. I think it was an early Israeli cell, and um, and I wrote a, ter a terrorist one who was a local terrorist. His 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 um, uh, agenda was to take down the, the Israel. So he's you can think of him as Hamas. Whereas terrorist number two is a, eject the West from the Middle East, and you can think of that as Al Qaeda. This was, before 9/11, before uh, I know Al Qaeda, but but then but we're hand, Jerry's hand up there handing out positions, and he just comes across terrorist number two first. So, yeah, terrorist number two, and everybody starts laughing because that they mean, implies there's a terrorist number one, and there might be a terrorist number three. Um, Bill Talon got that one that year. Uh, our first experience with Bill Talon. Bill Talon uh, was on our staff for a few years. He's he's gotten too busy in his own right, but he works for the Department of Energy. But he got terrorist number two, and there was a great uh, great thread where he put together a, a huge. He got he hijacked a 747 flying from Europe to the U.S. and then put, managed to get a huge quantity of chemical weapons in its belly. Uh, and again, this is before 9/11. Uh, so, um, so it's flying across and the U S cells and meltdown say, what do we do about them? And there are, there are passengers on board who are civilians and, and, and innocents and blah, 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 and blah, blah. And, uh, and it also talks to how we can play fast and loose with the time frames because while this 747 is flying across the Atlantic, the U S went, the U S legislators went through two budget cycles. You know, who cares? It works. Uh, they were doing their job, and the military people were doing their own. So the fact that one took one took four hours and the other went through two years, it worked. Well, that's the yeah, other thing that I saw that developed between like, I mean, I started playing in '96 because Walter yeah. played in '95, and we were friends. And he said, "You got to come play this game." So from '96 to about 2004, we went through this transition. And the transition was all about how we manipulate time. <laughs> yeah, yes. Jim, Jim, Jim Havlicek, I was part us on over to the shoot down. Okay. Yes. But, you know, the, the real issue there is we learn to manipulate time and how to compress it and expand it. And that's one of the things that has impressed the professionals when we went back to places like NDU because we figured out ways to separate players from one another so that they're unaware of things going on in other places sometimes and ways to deal with, okay, we doubled, the, we, we, we basically said your R&D is going to be two to three times faster than the real world so you can see the consequence of your decision. So that distortion is, you know, sometimes we slow all the play in the game down to deal with the international crisis so that everybody talks about it. And, and then other times we speed things up because that's kind of stuff's not going on. And when we don't realize when we have to do that is when we have problems like at Dragon Con last year, when the Chinese wiped out the North Koreans in a surprise attack within about a 15 minute time frame from making the first proposal that they do it to when they had completed it. Because we didn't really get them to deliberate and, and think about what they were doing and it distorted the game in a dramatic way. I mean, the players loved it, but it really, from our standpoint, was a I don't, I don't think the Korean players loved it much. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. <laughs> we we lost control of that. I think we were tired. It was our last convention of a long season. But um, anyway, go ahead. Uh, next slide, then. Um, yeah, at that point, we're getting to the late 90s, and we started to get one year after another, uh, completely uh, bizarre bizarre turns by an incompetent convention management. Um, it's like the people who dealt with it at first had forgotten who we were uh, or didn't know who we are, and sometimes they didn't know how to affect us. We, we were left out for years. We were left out of the convention book entirely. There would be, uh, I suspect, because uh, some lackey couldn't figure out if they wanted to put us in a role play in the role playing section or the live action role playing section or the this section, and it, no decision was ever made, so we didn't get put in there at all. Uh, so the advertising gets dropped off. Uh, registration desks. How many times we heard people saying, "I wanted to come to your game, but they told me at registration that we were sold out." 
Well, if you know us, you know we're never sold out. You know, we well some of, some of the games we're running now can be sold out, but but our free form game, legacy game, uh, we'll find we'll find a way to put you in somewhere. Um, but what it is is they didn't uh, the conventions had some. Uh, system that we, when they entered the game in their in their database, they had to less than a total number of players, and they couldn't make infinite, so they put three. So they sell three tickets for a game in which we could put in 120 if we wanted to. And when that was out, they they said, "Oh, yeah, no, sorry, they're sold out." So the player went and played something else and told us about it later. Whereas other players who knew us showed up anyway and got a got a spot. And the other um, distortion with that is because of the way they did metrics. You know, over time, we went from a special event because we had two military controllers doing a pseudo military type war game to becoming another hobby group in their eyes. So as a product of that, they started <clears throat> using the same mechanics for us that they used for the others. So that's why they say, well, you can handle 30 players and and, you know. But you, you can run 30 players, because that's the number we put in, but you can run 80. And if we put in 80, your metrics look like you're doing 10% and you're not a good operation. And that kind of measurement system is still a problem at the large cons because they believe that it's all a matter of metrics. It's not just the number of people that come and how happy they are with what they're doing. It's you predicted a number, you delivered a number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Dragon Con. We've we always had a good time at Dragon Con, but we're, we're off and on there. Uh, the Dragon Con is, of course, a, a fantasy science fiction fan based convention, and with a um, with a gaming aspect to it. And uh, as far as the politics goes, and who has power and who doesn't, uh, our main benefactor there, um, uh, Dave Cody. Sometimes he was able to get us on the docket. Sometimes he wasn't. One year, even we were. Uh, Dragon Con was the same, they, they scheduled Dragon Con the same week as Origins. And so Dan was going to go to Dragon Con and I was going to go to Origins. And then Dragon Con, with about a, a week and a half, two weeks out, uh, disinvited us. So Dan shift, shifted his tickets around. Uh, and, you know, we, we can't, we shouldn't be, we can't, we don't get mad at the guy who ha has been our benefactor the whole time. We can be mad at Dragon Con for doing that. You shouldn't pull the rug out of somebody like that. I was, in fact, wondering if we could get some type of a, uh, a a streaming going and having a game that was played simultaneously by cells in, uh, in Atlanta and in Columbus. But it was, I don't think the technology would have supported that. It was, we're still talking uh, um, late 90s, I believe. But anyway, uh, off and on at Dragon Con. Right now, we're back at Dragon Con and have been since 2013 in what seems to be a, an ongoing series, and we're being we're very successful there. Our larger conventions are, are you know, la last year our, our, we had our greatest turnout at Dragon Con, the first time that Dragon Con exceeded Gen Con. Uh, but that has more to do with how bad last year's Gen Con was for us rather than how good Dragon Con is. Nevertheless, our numbers are going up. They like us. We like them. We're not having any issues with that staff. So uh, we want to build on that. Um, now, Origins, <laughs> to have this line, Origins War College falls to the communists. Uh, the Origins War College, we had been uh, on uh, on their speaking schedule routinely since 1990 when Dan first started talking. Um, it got put, it got sent, given to um, a man who was a, a card carrying member of the American Communist Party. And I, you know, and he didn't like Dan's politics. He didn't like my politics. Um, didn't know my, anything about my politics. Dan's point is that he, Dan got purged and uh, in true Stalinist fashion, uh, they, he purged the whole family and started an active campaign against NSDM with the staff itself, with the, uh, with the origin staff itself. Um, now, I did some calculations based on the entire schedule. 70% uh, of the lectures in the origin war college while he was running it had something to do with Russia. 70% of those lectures, 54% the Soviets in, in World War II. Um, and um, it, it, he, he had an ob Dan, Dan wrote a letter using those stats saying, we don't share his obvious fixation. Uh, but at that point, we, weren't, we were not doing contemporary lectures. This is the world today. And the Soviet Union had collapsed. Uh, we weren't bad-mouthing the Russians particularly. Uh, well, Dan, Dan would take a shot at them, but we weren't speaking on historical topics back then. But Dan, he, he didn't like uh, didn't like Dan's politics, and he threw he threw us all out. And we, while he was on, we were not on the Arch War College series. We started our own lecture program. And in fact, after 9/11, we had a series of lectures, a, a long seminar about it, the NSDM seminar uh, on. Uh, uh, 
uh, and the war the war on terror, how things were going to evolve. And guess what? The Origins War College happened to schedule the exact same seminar with the exact with a uh, similar title at the exact same time. Um, so that neither here nor there. So we won't but, mention uh, names, but we will say that the person was like the head of the People's War Game Company, and he now resides in Florida and routinely shows up at HMGS Florida cons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And okay, his initials so, were Jack Brady, but other than that, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and but anyway, toward the end, toward that end, it was night. I think it was 1999. We were sitting in uh, Wednesday night before the convention started at Origins. We were sitting in the hotel room planning, and I'm looking. We don't have a mention in the registration book. We don't have a mention anywhere. Uh, the uh, at, at game registration, they had no knowledge of who we were. We were scheduled for a room. We were scheduled to give certain games at certain times, but there was no way a player could come to Origins and figure out that we were there. So I'm saying, I, I don't know how anybody's going to show up tomorrow at all. Uh, because they're, they're, So that at that point, we spent hours that night making the first NSTM poster. And it was, uh, uh, I, I took a picture of, um, took the, the old poster from The Longest Day, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, the old poster from the longest day, which showed a, a, a couple of Germans with a MG42 machine gun watching the Allied fleet, and I tweaked on it in um, uh, Photoshop to make it look like, in fact, I changed the helmets; so they didn't look distinctly German. I tried to make them look, in fact, a little bit Asian, and I put, uh, I turned what was the the the, uh, the sun rise into what looked to be a mushroom cloud, and I printed that out. And at that point, we just had a regular printer that made letter size. Uh, so I had to make about 20 sheets and then put them together and paste them onto a poster board. And the caption was, can you survive War 2K? Uh, NSDM, where we were, when we were, put up our schedule. And, and at that point, Origins wasn't stingy with signs. No, yet. Today, you go to one of these conventions, you see signs up everywhere. We, I didn't see any, pri any private organizations putting up signs at all. So... Yeah, having a, having a, having that sign at registration, uh, I think saved the day for us. We you had at least a few dozen people uh, at some of our games, and it built up or word of mouth, etc. But uh, we were, and and uh, Gen Con had its own problems, the same type. Again, another Gen Con game. Somebody showed up where our games were last year to to, in, to find our game starting again this year, saying, "I just went where you were last year because you weren't in the book." Yeah, you weren't in the book. Or some uh, again another Gen Con year. We were in NSTM, just the, the letters, not spelled out, no description of what we were, and that's how we were entered. So anybody who knows what NSTM was, they know what to look for, and they go there, and they find us, but yeah, uh, that, but that's where it's going to end. Um, we're not going to draw anybody new based on the description that we had there. So um, we were down to tens of people, for you know, sometimes less than 10 people, uh, down from our peaks where we're drawing, we're drawing 60 people at Origins, 80 people at Gen Con a couple of years earlier. Um, so it was a, it was a few painful years, but we went through more posters. We put, I made more posters. We put up more posters. We, uh, we put up our own website at that point. Um, Dawn Dupereau, our one of our staff members, started to make T-shirts. Now that helped subsidize her trip to the to the convention as well, but it provided additional advertising and mugs. Um, and I started to make the postcards that we still pass out today, postcard size, you know, the, usually the F, FA-22 on the cover um, and our schedule on the back. Uh, and uh, plus word of mouth and making announcements, doing everything we can. Now, Dan would schmooze the conventions. Uh, Dan would, uh, he would take, he would, he would buy some T-shirts from Dawn that he would hand out to the movers and shakers of the conventions. And he would... I, I would get upset at the time because you get everything moving in a game, get everybody excited, have a whole bunch of irons in the fire with things that he's supposed to do. And then he said, do you take over Mark? And then he'd disappear for four hours. <laughs> I'd be trying to run this game, not knowing really what was going on anywhere and trying to keep things, trying to keep things managed while he's, he's going off and, and talking to people and glad handing uh, it certainly would have helped. You know, it certainly helped recognition. People would know who we are and he'd call people, he'd email people between the, between seasons to try to try to get uh, a turnaround in some of this stuff and some you know, more, more recognition, get the uh, posters better. Um, I, I did, I've heard him 
in great in great frustration in some phone call saying, I, I just want to throw my hands up and walk away. I don't know how much I can talk to these people, how much information I can give them that they that they actually will pay attention to. Because as much as he talks, as much as he emails them, as much information he provides them didn't seem to help. And I was like, the talking real over challenges the world. with that whole process, I think, was the fact we were ne never either fish or fowl. Yes. I mean, now we're sort of in the, all the program books as a LARP, and we're known enough that that's not an issue. And we got back to the point where we could have generally, but not always, a paragraph or a page in the program that described us. But basically, when you look at the large cons, there are so many groups that are competing for attention. The tendency from those folks is to think everybody is a D&D &D table or a card table with six to 10 people, and you're all the same. You know, and, and you become, as they move more and more to the business model from people who were hobbyists and who loved doing stuff, uh, we had less and less awareness. So Dan being political was almost a necessity to keep us alive, but at the same time, it really didn't let us stand out. And it's the conventions that have recognized that we're different that we've had the most success with. And, and Gen Con sort of came around on that, and we, we have the the flow positive and now a little bit more negative than we did before. Origins was sort of that way. And I was hoping we were in the rebuilding years now before or, before Origins melted down this year um, because they had all new staff. Um, but basically the only places that really treat us as special now for sure are Escape Velocity and Dragon Con. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Okay, next. Oh, I got a picture of this contemporary. I thought this was nice because this this is one of the few good pictures of the brothers as a pair. And this is a connections when they were down at Air University. And despite the fact me hitting staff formally, I guess, in 2001, uh, I didn't get to go to that one and would have loved to because Matt convinced me to go to connections later. And we won't talk about how that's my new semi-professional hobby. Roll, roll back to that, would you? Yeah, I actually, I, I had to actually tweak on this a little bit because I wanted to uh, change the resolution so that uh, if, if it was too highly resolved, both of our glasses are flashing, are returning lights, the, gl light, the glare of light. So I had to tone that down. But the more I toned it down, the more the name tags uh, started to fade. So I, I, in fact, if and, and a forensic a forensic IT guy would probably say this has been doctored, but our faces, in fact, are doctored, to, uh, toned down, and then reinserted over our old faces. So I had to, I had to tweak on that thing. Um, they're still our faces. I didn't swap our faces at all, but <laughs> but it's actually actually three pictures there that all fit together. And I, I, I did not see, expect we were going to have pretty... fake news in the NSDM history presentation. <laughs> yeah. But you know, we've had it long time, like twenty years. years. Pretty seamless. I mean, I'm looking at that now and looking at me saying, "When did I go that gray?" <laughs> but I mean, that's that's the best picture I found, except the one with your cadet outfits. And I wasn't going to embarrass you that much. Because you both were babies. It was really bad. Okay. So we talked a little bit about that. Did you want to talk more on, on Origins War College? Um, yeah. Uh, when, once, once, once Jack was gone, uh, the War College, Origins War College started to get back in its feet in a more balanced manner, saying where it wasn't going to be uh, entirely, um, uh, wasn't going to be entirely focused on Russia. Uh, and in fact, you know, it, the, the statistics I did back when I said, okay, 54% of these lectures are on Soviet Union. I said, there's only one lecture at Maritime. It's only one naval lecture. And that was, in fact, Larry Bond being given an hour to talk about Harpoon, his new, his new Harpoon release. <laughs> so I said, yeah, this, this is, this is one side. But anyway, they, they started to get a more balanced presentation. We gave up on our own lecture series. We didn't, we rolled it back into theirs. They were certainly happy to have us. When, remember, we started in 1990, essentially NSDM was the origins of War College game. All right, and I, nobody ever looks at it that way. I kind of still do look consider it that way at Origins, that we're the we're the War College game. Although we're still we on their books, we're we're two separate things. We need to say remain two separate things uh, for political purposes. But um, uh, it's it's a lot better. Uh, you know, we're yeah, working well with them positively this year there because they were we, they were planning a special web page for the online program. 
there is planning to do one on the 30th anniversary for us. Um, we were starting to be treated a lot more professionally because most of the staff there was not knowledgeable of Gamma Zone history. And since I live in Columbus, we've had a couple of talks. So I, I sort of played folk knowledge and history there. And that seemed to be coming together, but now I'm not sure where anybody's going to be with the meltdown, which is something we could have a whole other presentation on that's not our shtick. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so then the nope. HMGS connection. Uh, yeah, uh, Dan. Uh, Dan Dan started to bring us into the Historical Miniatures Game Society. Uh, Dan got into miniatures uh, in a big way, uh, and we, we started a um, uh, his justification for bringing the, uh, uh, we as a role playing game essentially into uh, historical miniature convention is that we would the our scenarios in NSDM would generate miniature scenarios. Of course. You don't just on the spot make up a miniature scenario and run it. Those things were all planned ahead of time. So what he always had to do was then steer a game in a certain direction to generate this and this miniatures game that he was planning on running the next day, um, and usually had to do with a third, you know, some third party countries that weren't in play. So it was it was a uh, uh, rationalization, but it worked. Uh, now. NSDM, there are the purists that say that, uh, or HMGS, there are the purists that say it should be about historical miniatures, and I can understand that. Uh, eventually, there was a schism and a revolt, and we got kicked out. And there was, I don't want to go into the whole um, uh, Pete Panzeri, uh, uh, Bolt, you know, shift, trying to shift to Baltimore kind of thing here. But since I, I'm not, I'm not that qualified. I mean, the, the simple thing for people to be aware of <laughs> is we had large miniature games that ran 2,500 uh, GH2 style figures that, you know, led to many staff hernias <laughs> carrying lead back and forth. Uh, they sort of looked like the picture that we've got here. And about the same time that Dan got sick was when there was a whole internal fight over who should run HMGS. And it effectively meant that we stopped going to the HMGS cons because the, we weren't able to do the mini games very effectively without Dan. And we couldn't, didn't, we couldn't deal with the politics of what was going on in the leadership. And Dan was on the outs edge of that leadership, which didn't help us. So, you know, we haven't been back to HMGS in a long time, but we probably could go back at this point because the leadership's changed two or three times. And we may think about it, but the big thing is expense and time because everybody's doing it on their own budget. Yeah, and uh, some of our staff members do routinely go to HMGS. They enjoy the miniatures, uh, and that's fine. I, I don't I don't see being back to HMGS as an NSTM game. I do see us going back as potential lecturers. Uh, now, I put together in, in, uh, uh, 20, uh, 19, in 2018, on the 50th anniversary of the sinking of USS Scorpion in the North Atlantic, I put together what I thought was a, a very good lecture that looked at a whole bunch of different sources and I, I know I'm, I, I'm, I'm 99 for sure. I know, I know what happened. Um, and I reached out to them. Do you want me to give it at HMGS? I got kind of a lukewarm response. Um, if I pursued it, I could have probably gotten on their docket in, in, in 2019, but at that point it's not 50 years anymore. It's 51. Um, so maybe at some point we'll, uh, we'll, we'll continue. But as Merle said, it's a matter of how much time we want to spend to me. Uh, I think if we have additional time to spend, we should spend making it our making our game better, uh, and making the conventions that really want to see us there um, uh, get more for their get more for their money. So this is where I should put in the plug that anybody that wants to work long hours for no money and work as part of NSDM should volunteer <laughs> in the chat now. <laughs> now I want yeah, and I, I want to back that up saying yeah, we're we're perfectly w welcome to get the help. Um, but Dan and I both expressed frustration as to the uh, bringing in staff members who would uh, send emails and talk, talk forever about things that Dan and Mark should do. You know, there's no end of list of things that we that he and I should do. Um, so it, it kept going on and on. So we, we welcome people who are willing to, to give us ideas and then help work on it. That, yeah, because the, the other thing is our general technique is our management team can veto things, but we don't really stop things from happening most of the time. Basically, what we do is find out what people are excited about, and we say, hey, that sounds good. Let's tweak it a little bit, but let's run with it. 
because it's people's enthusiasm as volunteers that make NSDM the success that it is. Right now, we've got about 41 people that we call staff, quote unquote, but only about you know eight of them are regulars that show up at most events and show up when we do our camps to talk about how to design and manage and, and improve the games. So the problem with the entire process is bandwidth. Basically, what it means is we try to develop one new cell or update in a major way a cell every year, and we wind up tweaking two or three. So although we've done 26 countries in the modern era, right now there are only 13 that you can play and only eight of them that are really good because the models have Shh, gotten out of don't date. Don't tell people that. <laughs> but they won't know which ones. It's all fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but, yeah, you know, this Vietnam cell, it's great. <laughs> well, the Vietnam cell is being worked on, as well as an Israeli cell now for post-Netanyahu, but it's just coming off the board. That, um, I'd, like to, that I'd like to see. Uh, I, yeah. I see Nick, Nick, uh, Nick just uh, uh, talked in. Uh, in fact, uh, weighed in here as uh, I went to that lecture, Dragon Con. I believe you're talking about the my Scorpion lecture. Thank you. I appreciate you showing up. That was 79 people, um, but yeah, that was a good turnout. You know, anywhere else, I wouldn't complain. But there was over 100. Uh, that was in a time slot where I've been drawing well over 100 people for the last three years. So it was a little disappointing to, to see only 79 people. Uh, now maybe I'm too much of an old timer, or maybe I'm too much of a Submariner. I was really excited about talking about Scorpion, uh, and I, I get, people didn't share the kind of excitement that I, <laughs> that I was having for it. So oh, no, I'll go ahead. What, what were you saying? Were you were you done? I think we're ready to move from HMGS okay. to Fast Play. Yeah, Fast Play. Now, Fast Play, we initially started. Uh, it was initially started as the NSDM demo game. Uh, we we. Some of you remember we passed out survey. We haven't passed out surveys in a few years, but we passed out surveys to assess how well we're doing in a number of areas. And one routine comment was that people were having a hard time factoring in an eight-hour game into a three-day, three functioning, uh, three or four, four functioning three-day convention. And so I, I, I broached with Dan. Uh, can we try to figure out how to win, make a four-hour game of some type just to get people excited, and then maybe we'll come back to dates. Um, uh, yeah, Nick says, yeah, the room was packed like sardines, so maybe it was a blessing. Yeah, all right, <laughs> it was. But anyway, uh, so you know, we, we still had to figure out how to work that uh, that curtain, the, the wall in the back to open it up. So we've, we've done a lot better in those couple of rooms now. We're probably going to be there for the next few years anyway, so we, it's a good thing we know how. But anyway, um, uh, so I was uh, talking about the demo game. So, uh, after, so at the conclusion, I think it was Milwaukee. Uh, no, I think it was it wasn't Milwaukee. It was Indy. Indy. But uh, but uh, Dan 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 discussed the possibility of uh, trying to design some type of a four-hour game, uh, and Merle here stepped up to the plate and said, oh, "Okay, I'll take that on. I'll try. I'll try. Uh, I'll do. I'll do that. I'll put together some ideas for you, and uh, uh, we'll see where we run with it." Uh, since then, it's become our predominant event. It's taken on a life of its own, uh, and. We, I don't think we've run an eight-hour game in, in years, and uh, we've had a few six-hour games. Merrill, did you want to discuss where, yeah, what well, you were thinking of and how things evolved? The other thing is Fast Play itself has evolved. I mean, when it yeah. started, it was we tried to come up with a way to run a game fast. And essentially what I realized is that you had to boil it down a lot. And the original boil down was essentially – there were only four countries you could play because those countries were big enough that they were sort of near peer or peer competitors. You had the Russians, the Americans, the Iranians, and the Chinese. And then to make it go fast, we basically came up with a little business card format and didn't do, we did the, the normal political brief, but we didn't give you detailed descriptions of, of what you were about because prior to that, People were getting a half a page or page or two page write up for every position. And that was part of what was bogging people down. And, you know, it gave them a lot of depth, which was fun. But you couldn't do that in an eight hour game because we were doing in briefs that ran 45 minutes because Dan was super entertaining. And then we would generate play for about six hours and six and a half hours. And then we'd go into debrief that was another 45 minutes. So in right. four give hours, it, it, you gotta, you, you got to say, yeah. i got to brief it in 15 minutes, okay? And I've got to be able to debrief in 15 to 30, 
So how much playtime is left? So there's not a lot. And, so, and giving somebody a, a, three a half page, three quarters of a page, or a full page to read that is his motivation and his agenda is too much to expect him to read and absorb uh, in that, you know, if, if we're going to be cut it, trying to cut the game down. Now, I know you're, one of your objectives is to try to capture the essence of what NSTM is in an abbreviated format. Uh, and, uh, and, and I saw you gave – it was specific to you to say try these few things on the little card you gave him so that somebody had some, at least something they could jump in and start doing even if they haven't had time to absorb their entire position and all the implications of where they stand. And the and one of the cards was do this and get a reward. And yeah. they were designed so that you had to have several other players successfully work with you to get to that goal. The difficulty we got is, you know, we had a whole bunch of people in, in the early 2000s that had played a lot of NSDM, were very politically knowledgeable, very historically knowledgeable, and they started accomplishing this stuff in no time flat. So it's like, well, what else is there for me to do? And because they didn't have the full background beef on the characters, you had to say, well, go do this. So you'd come up with something on the fly, like you're the Iranians, come up with a way to infiltrate a nuclear uh, development cycle and, and get your own nukes. And then you'll get something. So we gave them like a power, an ability, or gigabucks, because we started implementing gigabucks that were roughly a billion dollars a piece. And as we played it, after like the third year we were doing it, we found that people just chased the money. And it distorted the entire structure of the game. So around 2004, we started trying to merge the two concepts, the regular game and the fast play game. And that's when we discovered the postcard format. And what that led us to was have a little bit more narrative. And what I thought was even more powerful was what I call the signs, symbols, and tokens of each country. Because your badge was very visual. It said the public things that were known about you. It had the, the emblems of the organization, the flags of the country, big print of your name. And then the back had all the stuff that says, this is what you can generally do and what you know and so on. And, and that's become the new core of the four-hour games with good and bad that come with it. Um, the good parts are we can get people to play fast. Uh, the good parts are that people who are knowledgeable will play the roles very well. And it, and it seems realistic. You know, you've got that, that real gestalt. The disadvantages are if you come in ignorant, you're still ignorant. And you struggle. And we wind up doing a lot of staff and facilitator briefings on what kind of thing you're interested in or what your staff would advise when you're faced with this challenge. So it put a lot more burden on us improving the quality of the staff. But I think that after having done it, when we went from 2001 to 2003, where we realized we had a big problem, to 2004, when we started to fix it, to maybe 2008 or 9 when we did fix it okay now we've had 10 years where most of the games have been more and more fast play because that's the block people would sign up for at a convention because they're right there at the buffet and there's too much stuff yeah this this year we stopped we, you know, we stopped calling it fast play you know this year yeah it's no longer it's now the nstm game and anything longer than that we'll call it we'll, well we'll call them all mega games actually if they're four hours uh we'll 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 have we'll find some 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 uh, grand looking sounding scheme to describe something that's going to run over four hours assuming we will again we probably will still be doing that at an academic level but i'm not sure we're going to be doing a running game longer than four hours at convention again yeah, i mean i think what we also discovered from the days when we were doing eight is that once you hit about seven people hit a fatigue factor so we i think we pretty much settled that you're going to run four hour games and six hour games and the six hour games are where you're going to be allowed to develop things more and do more brief in and more brief out. So those tend to be our professional and our academic venues. Um, and there's still a craving at some of the cons, but because there's so much stuff in competition, we can't see us going back to that at the major conventions. Uh, yeah, I want to point out Jeff's, Jeff uh, Havlicek, if I said that right, his comment is that the debrief is also very valuable, maybe a rolling slide presentation at the end to give flavor faster than the narrative brief, debrief rollout. Most of the fun part of the game is hearing what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, well, that's so, true, yeah. but we don't always know. 
<laughs> yeah, some, sometimes that's where we that's where we find out. <laughs> okay, because um, stuff goes so fast, and there's so many moving parts, especially in the bigger games. You know, uh, when we start doing the debriefs, a lot of the time, I know two or three questions to ask, and then it's the, what we draw out of the players. And, and that's sort of an acquired skill, too, in, in how to handle the debriefs. But it's like uh, we'll know certain major things, and we'll know the things that we had on our master insert list of things that might come up and then the players might react to. But they're so imaginative, especially at the big games, um, that you know we quickly wind up. If you get an 80-person game, 20 or 25% of it is the stuff we inserted. And the rest is all stuff generated by the players. So, yeah, and I, I know one of the things that does not work well for us is that um, when we start the debrief, you know, Merle's running that while I take the cell controllers off to the side to try to figure out who won and who didn't. Cell controllers are probably people who could really feed into that, but they can't be in two places at once. Um, so didn't didn't really work that way. Uh, so it's, if anybody could figure out how to be in two places at once. Now, some of the more recent games, the Crisis games, for example, two hours, we're not trying to decide who won and who lost anymore, and that 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 allows our controllers to be part of the TB process. Um, anyway, um, so are we done with that? Want to move on? I think so. Okay. Now, the Cold War game. Question. Yeah. Uh, well, it'll, it'll come up. Uh, now, the Cold War game. Uh, we said we never do a historical game. People people kept coming up for 15 years saying, oh, you should do this, you should do that. And and uh, Dan and I would, would were of one mind, shoulder to shoulder, said, well, for one thing, we have to train a whole staff about some different period. We have to put out a whole new set of rules, we uh, new cells. We have to get everybody up to at least a common baseline uh, so that they, so they're all on the same page in terms of what this is. Uh, and uh, so we said, no, we won't do and do that. And then one year, I think uh, 2006, 2007, Dan said, oh, and I told um, Arjuns or somebody, I told her we'd be running a Cold War game. You, you did what? <laughs> we'd be running a Cold War game. Why don't you take that on, Mark? Um, yeah, right. <laughs> so we ended up with a 1960, 61, 62 start um, before the Cuban Missile Crisis. And... Uh, we started, so we put together a U.S. cell and a Soviet cell, using a lot of the old uh, uh, try the tri the tree part system for the Soviet Union, and and then Dan got uh, paranoid, saying, "What if we don't have enough people? What if too many people show up?" I said, "Well, we can crew up. We can crew up 50 people with this this structure we have. What if more show up?" So I said, "Okay." So I put together a Chinese cell, a uh, red Chinese cell, modeling the you know, same Soviet system, only even more so. Um, and I said, okay, we're ready to do it. And then, well, what if more people show up? Yeah, and you, you're, you're still scared about that. We can do 79 people. We haven't had a 79-person game in years. And we'll figure something out otherwise. So so we started. that's how we started the Cold War game, uh, 1962. It was a lot of, um, um, uh, of uh, you know, well, it's, it's interesting. It, it only works because a lot of us already knew that at that time times uh, uh, very well in the first place. Um, so I think we, uh, if we <laughs> if we just try to package up the rules and give it to some other set of gamers, I think they'd they'd be kind of lost. But it's what it's it's a popular game. The you, the surveys we pass out usually indicate that it's a little less popular than our contemporary game. People want to come see the contemporary stuff, but. For what it's worth, it's still uh, still something we do. We like to get the academics involved. We ran it at uh, Campbellsville University for a bunch of high school students. It was the high school student game, right? That high school was, and, we and yeah, we high school we did Cold War and we did Contemporary for the college. Yeah, and uh, so all the uh, we had a lot of fun with that. Um, uh, and uh, when we we're we're still we're still working on it. We since um, we have the U.S. Uh, Soviet cell. We've got the the red Chinese cell, which is. Could he probably use some work, but it works. It's not. It's not meant. Yeah, I only built it so it could be tacked onto the Soviet cell. Without a Soviet cell in play, the Chinese cell is going to be kind of lost. But we have a Cuban cell that we built out of our Cuban Missile Crisis you know, two-hour game, and we have uh, uh, at this point an Israeli cell and a UK cell that we like a lot. So we could do a lot with that if we, you know, if if there's enough interest and enough time. Um, 
And right now we have just started exploring and ran ran our first 1980s game with the it was the U.S. cell, right? And we're going to the Soviet cell next time. But uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis has, has uh, killed any immediate ability to move forward with that thing. So the other but, thing uh, to bring up about Cold War games are, you know, originally we started it as a one-time test and it's sort of grown. And I'll be honest with you, I think that overall, because the Cold War period doesn't change and we have a lot more resources in terms of research, what it essentially has let us do is build a higher quality product. I think we have a lot more fidelity to reality for the Cold War and we've been able to diversify. I think ultimately we're going to have uh, more than the five cells. We might go to a sixth because we probably will build an Israeli cell. We had one at one time, but we aren't real happy with it, so we didn't. We stopped playing it. But um, the fidelity and accuracy of those cells is a lot better, and I think they're really good for an academic environment, and that's where we want to try to push it and sell it. But the other thing that we started working on was the 80s, and we were looking around 83 for the Able Archer thing, because what you find in the traditional Cold War things around the 60s we have to get more and more imaginative over time as we run the event again and again to have storylines that are very worthwhile um, for people to, to explore. Because, you know, in that period, the Russians beat up on anything that happens close to them and anything that happens far away from them, the U.S. Navy and Air Force clobbers them. So there are only a handful of things without getting more fantasy oriented that you can do. I mean, you can go back to 56 and play with Suez. You can do stuff with that. You can do the missile crisis. You can do a crisis of revolts in Europe. You can do some North, you can do some African revolutions and South American revolutions. But even there, we have to stretch capabilities to make a game that's fun. So we try to be very careful about that. Uh, the 80s will give us a lot more flexibility because even though we now know that the Soviets had a house of cards on a lot of areas. They were a formidable foe in that period because they had so much in the way of military resources and infrastructure. And even if tank for tank, they weren't as good, they had a lot more tanks, you know, and a lot more planes. So it was, it's a big deal. So that's the next, one of the development paths we've got going right now. Um, the other thing I, I want to mention briefly is there are some periods we don't want to gain. And that's part of why when Dan and Mark were approached with doing historical games, the big thing everybody wanted was a World War II one. And to do an NSDM game with internal and external tension means somebody's going to be gas and Jews. And that wasn't someplace we wanted to go. We don't want to get to the point where everybody's hot buttons are hit in an NSDM game, which is also why the past couple of years we have very sparsely played the U.S. cell. <laughs> yeah. That that brings me back to another you know, fun uh, fun anecdote. We were, it was a um, I think it was at an, an HMGS convention, and we had an Iranian cell that was being run by Pat Jewett, one of our veteran controllers, and the yes, young lady, probably eighteen, uh, is playing Hezbollah, and she puts together some plan of action, whatever. I don't remember what it was. I don't think I ever heard, but uh, the. As she's walking away, she presents it to Pat, he acknowledges it. She's walking away, he's got this other idea. He needs to understand what the rules of engagement are. So he yells to her across the room, it's okay to kill Jews, right? <laughs> and I, I quickly say, in the game context, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, it, that, that could have been, been taken so far out of context. But um, it, I, I just thought it was hysterical to, at the time. Um, but, but we have we've since put together our uh, U.S. secession crisis two-hour game, which uh, brings you from Lincoln's election through to um, the origin of the Civil War to see if the different powers can, in fact, come to a, a reconciliation that doesn't involve a civil war. Um, and we have put a slide up at the very start saying the requirement, the historical requirements for role playing here require people to take positions and state uh, uh, values that to, to by today's standards be considered horrifically racist. Please understand the academic nature of this game. And this is what we're trying to do because we can't simulate properly the agendas and motivations of all these people and get a feel for what's going into the history unless we factor those uh, ideas into the player positions. And, and we've never had a complaint about it. So, uh, but it's, it's something you got, we, we need to, uh, 
uh, need to be very careful of but when we tread lightly, especially in today's in a polarized political environment where everybody's highly charged and there's a lot of people are just waiting to jump down somebody's throat or start screaming at somebody about Yeah, something. I mean, if we did the Civil War game again today, there would be a lot of people talking about modern morality rather than the kinds of compromises they could have made in the period. Now, one of the things that I thought was really interesting as we worked on that experiment uh, and the players came up with proposals, we were doing some research because we were already at the age where we could do some internet searches. And one of the things that we did, that was proposed that sounded eminently reasonable to modern people was that the government should just buy all the slaves and free them. But when you look at slaves as property and capital investment in an infrastructure, and the fact that you then have to educate them and do everything else, there wasn't enough money in the whole country to do that, which is part of the reason why they kept having these plans where, okay, you can't extend it, or okay, the next generation's free. And you know there are all kinds of broken problems with that, but even people of goodwill have to deal with the economic reality of how do you feed all these people? How do you train all these people? How do you deal with all that, even if the current situation's absolutely abhorrent? And that's the kinds of things that we can learn from those games. And we don't have to be happy with the result. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so we've done experimental games on that. We did an experimental game on World War I, where we dealt with from the time of the assassination to the time of, of uh, essentially the first month or two of the war. Um, and we learned some other lessons there because there are a lot of things that they don't teach in a standard history class about why most European nations didn't take the Austrians seriously when they were talking about going to war with the Serbs. One of the big things is there was no official funeral for Ferdinand's wife because she was not allowed to be in the line of succession, nor were her children. You know, so there's, there's a whole bunch of issues there. Sophia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, anyway, the last point I wanted to make about discussing the history of, the, of our Cold War game, when I designed it, I try to design in something that I always wanted to do because to me, I it always seemed to me that most of the players were getting excited when we actually ramped up a crisis, when there was something happening that they all had to get together, talk it over, come up with a course of action, feed it in, a secondary course of action, move things along like that. And that goes back to one of our best games um, in the late 1990s. Um, uh, and I could go, that's the game where Iran was the uh, the facilitator cell, a small, small Iran that the players thought they're playing with Iran and they just moderated. Um, we had um, Wade Racine running that, and we turned him in, into the, the new Mahdi. We played the, the whole Mahdi scenario where this new highly characteristic leader uh, starts to, starts to take, uh, take charge in the Middle East, getting buy-in from both Sunni and Shia. Uh, and he took over as as the Mahdi, and you know, both you know, all the other player soldiers started to go into meltdown uh, as things started to progress. They just didn't know what to do, and but but they had a lot of fun as players. They had a lot of fun with it. So um, I built into the Cold War game the strategic version and the crisis version. So everybody had both a, a strategic role and a crisis role, uh, different different characters to play. And you know, a lot of people we say, okay, let's stop. We're going to shift to crisis mode. They they put away the one character. They forget they were that character and take over another character. It might be related, probably knows so much the same things. But instead of a month to year time frame where they're working on a policy and budget and long term national priorities, they start dealing with the, the bombers that are coming over the pole uh, at that moment. And the time frame turns into minutes. Um, so we had a part of that. Uh, and I it in an eight hour game. Practicing that transition, we, we worked, we exercised it once, and we, to, uh, at the start of the game, so everybody knew what to do and how to go back. It was usually some type of a, I, 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 I throw in a, um, a, a false alarm scenario uh, to get everyone in crisis mode, okay, and then they go back to the drill. So we we'll drill. So later on, you know, about two thirds of the way into the game, we went into crisis mode. We threw the real crisis at them. We let them resolve that, and then we went into debrief. And I thought it was a good construct. It doesn't work very. Doesn't translate very well to four-hour game because you don't have time to do all that. Uh, so in the uh, about 2011, 2012, we reworked it so that we took away this whole strategic mode. The fright, everybody's now got a role playing. Game, role playing part in that that they're actually doing something to take to take part. So a lot of the um, 
uh, but at least the so you know, we didn't re we didn't change the uh, the Chinese cell, but the Soviet and U.S. cells. Right now, you get your position, you stay your stay in your position, you're doing role playing, and uh, that seems to work. Uh, but it it goes back to two, uh, two different design philosophies. Mine mine always has been going toward the make things happen or let the players make things happen that need to be responded to right now, and then let them move on to something else. Let them respond to that right now, uh, and. Uh, minimize the let's sit down and talk about something for the next 45 minutes and then write something down on a piece of paper and, and fill in a sheet um, because I think that's a lot less fun. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, Nick, want to go to the next slide? Sure. And in fact, that whole crisis mode thing, if, you, if you've if seen some of the uh, last, uh, uh, the two hour crisis, crisis games we've been playing for the last couple of years, I've just taken that part out of it and essentially have been implementing those for those those structured games. So for those that um, remember the old maps, this is sort of what they looked like. Yep. I took pictures yep. before they got retired. Okay. Yeah, and I'd uh, I, I'd I'd make all those. I'd put these those stickies on a letter size thing and print them through. And you had to do some Kentucky Kentucky windage to get the colors right because if you try to put print red on an orange sticky, it comes out different. Uh, so, uh, but it, it worked out pretty well. And I also got it where I can, uh, for a third, uh, a third world country, if you see in the lower right here, um, you see a lot, a bunch of generic things put on, uh, generic markers. I could put together a nation cell using an Excel spreadsheet. I, I enter how many troops they have, how many armored vehicles, how many tactical aircraft, how many combat warships, and I get an entire order of battle that I can then hit print on and make then put those labels on stickies and have the nation up and running in about 10 minutes. Any nation that somebody says they decide they want to attack uh, that we don't already have a set uh, set of markers for. Uh, and it, it kind of worked out for, kind of worked out well. So, um, so Dan Dan got sick. 2008 was the last set of con last conventions he went to. Um, he passed away in uh, 2017. 16. Um, long. It was 2016. Yeah. Uh, in fact, at last uh, and Merle Merle here was the first person to notice that there was something really wrong with him. Um, even his wife you know, didn't didn't notice. And Merle ended up with him rooming with him at an HMGS convention and came up to me and said, "What's wrong with Dan?" I, said, I don't know. We all just kind of thought he was tired, but it was a version of dementia called frontal temporal disorder. Uh, and by, I retired from uh, the reserves, and that was like March when you noticed that, Merle, I think. Yeah, because uh, basically it was like he had the, the like he had had a mild stroke. He was doing some repeating of the same things he talked about and wasn't yeah. too disjointed, but it was just enough that it was off. Yeah. Um, and then from the, the time we had that that spring convention to the time we had Origins, Origins was where it was really terribly apparent because I picked him up at the airport and he had a headset on. And, you know, Dan was the kind of guy that he'd come up, well, how are you doing? Everything great and everything and all that. And it, it was kind of subdued. And we picked up his luggage and went to the car. And, you know, he turned the radio on the car on like full blast almost, listening to music and jamming to the music all the way downtown. Now, normally he would be saying, how's everything? Is everything ready? All the things we got to do. And I get him downtown and we won't go to the wrong hotel because he doesn't remember what hotel they put him in, which was kind of odd, you know. But we set him, get him to the right hotel. And then the next morning we're, we're headed down, you know, I go back downtown because I live in Columbus. And we're headed down to the lecture halls and the game rooms, and he's stepping on every crack in the two-foot carpet squares. And I'm going, oh. And we get in the room, and he does his, his shtick for the presentation to, for the in brief for the game. Everything's all fine. And Michael gets there, Mike Tucker, and he gets there a little late, and he says, who are you? He didn't <laughs> recognize Mike Tucker. And at that point, it was like, Damn. Well, Mike had lost a lot of weight. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not, not enough. But it was like, holy shit, we got a problem. And that's where we called his wife and said, hey, we need to do something. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, you had remembered stuff from your retirement ceremony. Yeah, I had retired from the Navy Reserve in, in uh, May 
Uh, you you noticed in March first in May, um, I, we, the whole family. He he drove up with his wife for my retirement, and our father saw it as well. And we said there's there's something really wrong. And at that point, Ruth, his wife, Ruth, started to look for look for answers. What's wrong here? Uh, and um, uh, it took about six months to get a, a definitive diagnosis. The, the psychiatrists were all saying it's psychological. Uh, <laughs> the neurologists say it's neurological. Uh, no, there are no signs of a stroke. But yeah, she had ended up having to go to um, Johns Hopkins, a specialist at Johns Hopkins, who actually read uh, some of the descriptions of what, what was going on and pulled out a, a piece of paper and handed it to, to Ruth. And these described exactly what she was seeing. And he said, that's generic for frontal temporal disorder. That's, uh, you know, I can see exactly what's going on. They, so they figured that out. Um, after oh, Origins, oh. And our, you know, Dan, Dan was on the lecture program for Origins, gave, gave his lectures, but he was generally read, just reading the slides. It's clear to me he, there were lines in the slides that he did not recognize and did not know how to speak to. Um, so I talked to Ruth after that, and we decided uh, we can't bring him to Gen Con. Gen Con will be in another six weeks. We don't know how, what's going to happen by then. Well, by six weeks, he, he couldn't talk anymore. Um, and, and the thing that was really horrible from my perspective is because <clears throat> the, the mental issues became so great, he lost his job and he said, don't come even to base. I mean, he had a position with the clearance and he couldn't maintain the clearance because he obviously was having mental issues. And it took him so long to diagnose it that they didn't really recognize it until he'd been released from employment. So he fell back on his VA benefits. And you know, that was horrible to watch what was going on with Ruth. I mean, you saw it a lot closer than I did, but, you know, it became, you know, a, a physical, a mental, an emotional, and a financial catastrophe in a cascade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. My Our, our father and I worked, worked to get the uh, his kids through college, at least. Uh, that that was uh, adding the financial distress, but uh, but at least you know they're they're all doing fine. Uh, I assume they're doing fine because I haven't heard from them. I'd hear from them if they weren't doing fine. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they're both they're both down in New York City now, hopefully surviving the the virus. Um, but anyway, uh, for for what it's worth, you know Dan was out and twenty and at Gen Con we you know put on the first game NSM games ever that didn't have Dan running them at Gen Con in, uh, in 2008. Um, and I remember telling everybody, we can do this. And, you know, I, I, yeah, he, he's, he started games and turned them over to me and disappeared to go schmooze the convention. So I, I had no problem finishing the convention. Yeah. But I, I pulled everybody together and said, I, I can't take on everything Dan did uh, because I have my strengths and weaknesses. And Dan and I complimented each other on our strengths and weaknesses. But if I tried to take on what the stuff he did, I ended up like, General Savage and twelve o'clock high, uh, you know, lying on my cot weeping. Um, so Merle at that point agreed to stand to step up and, and uh, take on a lot of the game design, uh, as well as being the main interface with Origins. Uh, Pete Ruacco, another staff member, agreed to be uh, take on the uh, convention coordination with Gen Con, and Robert Mosher agreed to take on facilitator control and, run, and try to run the scenarios. And it was something that worked pretty well until Pete got sick, too. Uh, and at that point, we weren't doing Dragon Con. We were on a stuff for like four or five year hiatus from Dragon Con. But we, we, uh, we managed to continue and we took on roles and we settled into those roles. And I think it's, we've been able to move on. It, the, games, the games certainly evolved. Um, yeah, without Dan's influence, we've taken in our, in our our own directions, and I'm I'm pretty happy with things so far. Um, he hasn't so anyway, told me uh, yet. Just for the record, everybody. <laughs> when one of the things we did was we started to sh uh, over the over the years uh, since then we shifted more to, to more to the fast play games. We could run two fast play games in the space. We have um, one eight hour game, and we have more people uh, would would come. Um, and anyway. Uh, we uh, uh, so our, our standard then became uh, f uh, uh, fast play game on the first uh, two fast play games each on the first and second days of the convention with an eight hour mega game on the third day and in that week also carved out uh, Cold War games uh, back to back uh, first day se second game second day first game so we only have to swap our maps out once 
uh, or we swapped out our maps out twice. We didn't have to go back and forth between one set of maps and another set of maps. We, you need a different set of maps for Cold War than you have for, for uh, units, the unit markers. The map's the same, but you need to set a different unit markers. Um, and uh, and we, the facilitator sheets are all different. Between, uh, so we'd have to take those down, put up another set. Uh, so that became our staple for a while. At that point, we started also introducing two-hour games. Uh, it started with the... Um, I, I believe it started with the Secession Crisis game uh, that Robert and Mike Tucker uh, designed uh, to examine uh, the U.S. 1860, 1861. I don't think they were ever able to prevent a civil war no. in, in any of these games. Several times. Failed every time. But but, uh, but they had uh, they they passed out the motivations and they had a constant running stream of injects uh, simulate to uh, to talk about the different. Uh, uh, different speeches being made, uh, different nations, different states that were voting to secede uh, to just keep the pressure up. And I saw that format and I liked the format and I thought it would be a good format for the Cuban Missile Crisis game, uh, which is what ultimately uh, uh, Pete Barocco and I built out of that one. Uh, but in the meantime, we also put, you know, uh, Merle, it was you, you and Robert and uh, Ronald on the World War I game? Uh, yeah. Were you the architects? Okay. Well, Ronald um, helped out, but it was mainly um, myself and uh, Robert. Okay. Because we were focusing basically from assassination to mobilization. And what we found there is we actually didn't model it far enough because yeah. after we did a couple iterations, the Russians realized that if they didn't mobilize immediately, they would never see troops before the end of the game. Because <laughs> we actually looked at the, the historical mobilization tables, the approaches, and we tried to say, you know, do you want to negotiate? Do you want to do this? And they sent diplomatic notes back and forth. But the, the long and the short of it is they realized very quickly that the guy that mobilizes first has a huge military advantage. And the guy who takes the longest to mobilize better start before it ever begins. But the byproducts are you start losing guys to bring in the crops. Uh, the Austrians in more than one scenario decided to mobilize and couldn't bring in the crops. So had to find other sources of food or let people starve. Uh, there are a whole bunch of, of interesting side lessons, but we never got to the point of real significant shooting because everybody didn't have their troops on the field. Mm -hmm. Couldn't happen. At any rate, uh, over the years, we were building a, a core staff. Uh, uh, you know, people like you know, Jason or Sean have been a crucial. Uh, yeah, crucial staff members to us. And a lot of them didn't know much about what they were doing when they came on board, but they've been doing this now for 15, 20 years, and they've run these cells over and over. Uh, and you know, I tell you, one of the, I told you about my strengths and weaknesses. I don't think I would ever be able to run a cell very well. I did run cells sometimes back in the early 1990s, but it's not where I'm where my strong point is. Uh, but someone like Sean or Jason, they're great at it. I mean, they've really um, come into their own in terms of the facilitation yeah. skills. Yep. And and each one has their own twist. I mean, for example, when we did Campbellsville, Sean was great to run the Israeli cell in the Cold War because, you know, he's, he's Jewish by background. He knows a lot of the history. His examples were very good. He could make the, the students feel at a gut level what was going on. Now, for some other time periods, he doesn't have that kind of depth, but he's a really good facilitator. And he knows how to roll with things. Jason, on the other hand, is, is very useful in historical context and trying to deal with realism. And he gets along with everybody. So, I mean, they, they both have their skill sets that are really valuable. And then we've got other folks that we've used at one or two conventions that have run enough that they're good facilitators, but may not have the depth of experience or the depth of knowledge about a particular scenario. Because, you know, again, it's a volunteer. So even if we have a camp and talk about these are the basic lines we want to look at for the summer, you know, and, and these are the kinds of storylines we're exploring. There's not a lot of time for familiarization when it's somebody's hobby. Yeah. And the more, the more we have uh, our trained core staff experience, the more Merle can actually pay attention to things he needs to be paying to as game director. The more I can be doing military and eco economic stuff, the more Robert can or maintain things on a high level and say, okay, we'll move in this direction and give instruction to the facilitators. And they, they go off and they start doing things in that direction. Uh, at that point, and we're, we're still, we're still at it. Uh, we are over the years, adding more play nation cells in both the contemporary game and the cold war game. Uh, I put together with Pete Ruacco, the Cuban missile crisis 
uh, game, which is, if you've ever played it, it's, uh, it, there are really three Cuban Missile Crisis games, one Havana Paranoia, uh, one Moscow Megalomania, and one Washington Wobblies. And they're built to be run with 12 people. We've expanded to 13. But it's been my experience, you go much beyond that and you end up with a debating society instead of a core group that can actually make decisions and talk things through. So I wanted to limit it to those. And each of those cells is built to run, primarily built to run by itself uh, with uh, uh, really two controllers and an IT guy. Um, and once you know, once we have the our network up and running with military maps and inject the IT guy, could probably take a walk, assuming it's up and stable. But it's so it's meant to meant to occupy 12 or 13 players with two staff members. And uh, we we don't like saying there's no positions left, and sometimes we've had to. But it's uh, but as a two-hour game, it's it's okay. Um, and I thought it's historical and I liked it. And we, I used the same type of format that they use for the succession crisis where there's a constant flow of injects to keep the pressure up. The idea is keep the pressure up. Uh, uh, 70, 80, 90 minutes, is acknowledge the decision to make some things happen and then stop and have a debrief. And I think it's been successful. I think people have enjoyed it. And I think it gives us good credentials on it as an academic. Uh, academic game. Um, just, just an aside, it, it has done that for us because it's been recognized by professionals and we were asked to run it at WinSec, which is uh, down at Fort Benning for military officers. So, I mean, that's where our game tech has evolved to the point where we are competitive with the professionals in a lot of environments because we've got enough professional background. So it's, it's one of the things that I always stress is we, we structure the games that we play around the event because the way we play the same scenarios, even if we've got the same injects at Origins, Gen Con, and Dragon Con are fundamentally different because the audiences are different. There's more leeway we give the science fiction cons for people to do more what you call off the wall things and creative things because there's that balance between game and simulation. If we're at Origins, traditionally we ran much more historically and tight, but even that's changed because Origins has changed. Um, but like when we do a university event, we try to keep a lot of fidelity. So the, the extremes get contained. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to show is, yes, we're in the 40 years of Gen Con anniversary book. So you can go look us up because Dan did an interview that had stuff in that book. Um, we also started doing new kinds of posters. You know, I don't have a couple of pictures of some of the good ones we put in the hall. I got to pull those out and take a photo before they retire. But um, the 60 show poster is a good example. And we lost Dan in 2008, which we talked about. Then the other thing is how we've diversified over the years. Uh, Mark, you want to pick it up from there again? Yeah, uh, we actually, at the about 2008, Peter Rocco, who's a, an attorney, got us a, a, a nonprofit and co corporate status. I'm not sure that's still active anymore. We haven't no, tried to, you know, we have tried that, but NSDM Incorporated existed uh, as a nonprofit educational organization. We've done games, academic games at Ashland University. We went to Rudicon and Connections. Uh, we did some. Sea Cadets in Newport, Rhode Island. Sea Cadet training in Newport, Rhode Island for a couple of years. An old old shipmate of mine, uh, Bruce Inzer, his wife was uh, the the the, com the commander of the Sea Cadet group. Now Sea Cadet, they're not they're uh, they're, uh, they're not Sea Scouts. They're Sea Cadets. They are actually they climb into a military uniform and they operate under military discipline. But they're age 13 to 18, uh, and they're people who are looking to. Uh, for a career in uh, in the in the U.S. Navy, and uh, we we did a few training games for them. Ball State University, an academic game for them that uh, that went very well. Two of them did. Did we do two two for them? I can't remember. Yeah. But uh, National Defense University wanted us down because they were interested in how we can do real time adjudication. If you look at military, if you look at any games for the government, it, they're all structured. You know, the outcome of one move is determined because they have presentations to make the outcome of the the, 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 the entry of the next move. And they wanted to see how we did that. And we, we gave a demo game for them that I thought, thought was very well received. A couple of games is a training event for um, military uh, Marine Corps intelligence activity uh, training program. 
Uh, and last year we, we were at Campbell's University for the first, Campbellsville University in Kentucky for the first time for an academic game, both a uh, college game, contemporary college game and a, a Cold War high school game. The high school uh, high school uh, teachers really loved us. Uh, I, think, I think it was very well received. We were at Escape Velocity in the Washington, D.C. area a couple of times. It's a, that's a science and science fiction convention. Uh, so we ran science fiction-y scenarios. Uh, but, uh, they, but they seem to like us. But again, it's, it, those are fairly small. I'm not sure how big it's going to get. Yeah, uh, but they seem about 2,500 people, although it is growing. We have been invited back to that, but it's going to be a virtual convention this year, so there will be no games. Uh, Campbellsville, we'd already been invited back at, and I don't think we're going to have a physical event, but we may offer an online event if we work out the bugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that one was nice because Campbellsville, we actually were allowed to invite alumni to come play, and we had one guy come in from South Carolina with his significant other, and they both played and had a wonderful time. And he was very helpful for the U.S. cell because we made him president, and he helped educate the high school players in how to play NSDM. So he had once again corrupted small minds. <laughs> and the Western Hemisphere Security Co-op, that's what WinSec is, right? Um, yeah. But um, uh, they, they, we ran a Cuban Missile Crisis game for them. And Merle, Merle told me like two weeks before we were supposed to go, oh, we have to give this whole, whole game in Spanish. Okay. So I learned Google Translate works really well. So we translated all of our Cuban Missile Crisis stuff over in Google Translate. And I'm sure some of these people who speak Spanish as, as their first language look at that and across the right saying, I, I think I know what they're trying to say, but it came through pretty clearly. And then this seemed to be rather well received. So, so the other part of this story is it's a classic example of the kind of problems we have anytime we go somewhere. One, because we're different. And two, because People don't understand what they need to do. Um, you know, they asked us to do this class, and it was for basically Spanish speakers, because WinSec is the new name for the, what used to be the School of the Americas. So we had a number of American students that were Spanish speakers, but we also had the vast majority were Latin American, Central American students, that their first and only language was Spanish. So they had told us we were going to have to do the event, and we were going to have translators. And that was fine. And we sent them documentation ahead of time that they were supposed to uh, have translated from English into Spanish because we, we built folders that were very, you know, 60-ish looking with all the background on your Dean Rusk and this is what you're about and, and all those kinds of things. And they didn't do it. And we didn't find out until we got there the day before. So all the evening before, we're writing every sheet of like, 30 some documents through Google Translate, rerunning them and then running them off the portable printer I brought along because I always try to bring a printer because I know something's going to go wrong. And, and it was just another example of the joy of uh, trying to do a professional type event in places nobody's ever seen anything like you. Yeah, but for what it's worth, I thought it came out very, very nicely. I had two printers running and and an inject. I feed it in, you know, take the grab the English, feed it into Google Translate, grab the Spanish, copy it into either the, uh, one word document that's going to go to the the uh, the Cuban cell, another word document that's going to go to the U.S. cell, and it comes out with the right header. So uh, uh, Craig. Um, uh, Craig would grab that and he'd look, uh, see what the header is. It goes to them. This goes to them. Uh, it it worked re it worked re it really worked nicely. Worked, we, did, we didn't have really we didn't well. have the military we didn't have the mil we didn't have the military maps up. Unfortunately, um, we didn't have enough uh, things that were working the right uh, a modern enough version of Windows. Um, so, uh, if we had a little bit more time to to play with the things we brought, if we brought brought Ron, Ron down, for example. And with a with a day or so to hook things up, it would have been even nicer. But for oh, what yeah. it's worth, I think I think it worked well. Basic uh, electronics up, <laughs> and we did have translators, and it helped that I'd had you know a year of high school Spanish, so I sort of understood half the things they were giving me, so I could know how to route them and schedule them. But another example of the nuttiness is, you know, we get there, we find out they haven't translated documents. Oh, by the way, the air conditioning in the building is out. Oh, okay. it's, so it's southern, southern georgia, georgia. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay. And by the way, just so you know, Mark, at the end of that session, you blew my data plan because I had to do everything off of my phone as a mobile hotspot. So I had to change my data plan after that. But it was still hilarious because it's like everything that could go wrong from somebody else went wrong except for the room and the people. Well, actually, the room and the people and the translators. Because we did get translators, and they were wonderful translators. Yeah, I, very impressive to hear some of these ladies. As fast as Merle or I, or I are talking, they are translating to Spanish for them. Uh, and, it's and very, very impressive to see somebody like with that kind of skill. And one of the translators was a youngster whose family escaped Cuba when the revolution happened. Mm -hmm. So she had a lot of insights into things as we went through the, the entire program. Okay. Um we're getting toward the end now, but con convention issues, I talked about part one, the, the late 1990s and the early 2000s when Dan was Dan was ready to throw his hands up and say, I don't want to come anymore. I don't want to. But uh, but things started to arise uh, five, six, seven years ago. The Origins, the war years. Now, the previous management at Origins had, had, had uh, dr driven the convention to such a financial hole that they brought in John Ward to try to straighten things out. Um, but he didn't want to pay any attention to anything that didn't make money for them directly. Uh, he, what, he wanted to start cutting us down on signage because uh, any spot uh, where somebody could put up a sign, potentially he could sell uh, that spot to somebody. Uh, but we did, uh, but that included lack of attention, included not following through on written agreements he made on what we were going to get uh, as far as signage space. And part of it had to do with the fact that he didn't have a, a he didn't have a, a, a budget to hire anybody competent. Um, so uh, the convention was withering, um, the, but they were playing games with the I said gases, playing games with the numbers uh, to make it look like it wasn't. But we were walking through saying this convention is a ghost town for, for a number of years, and, uh, and our our kind of fine too. So we actually had one game. We had four people show up. We ran the game, but we had four people show up for a Cold War game. Yep. And uh, in fact, we we kind of made our own uh, own version of a Cold War game from scratch. We, we took them back to 1950s, and Stalin just died. And uh, they talked about it for a while, and it, I think they had a good time. But uh, uh, very few teams could do what we did in that game. <laughs> um, several, a couple of our staff members have said that they would never come back to Origins, and. Maybe we'll talk them into it now, but we need to start to try to rebuild uh, rebuild something. And this this virus has put everything on hold, but we had a, a sizable lecture schedule uh, planned. We still have a modest lectures, lecture schedule online planned at Origins. But uh, the last couple, last couple of years, we've ran uh, one short game and one long game uh, each you know, because our staff is substantially down from what it was. Um, at Gen Con, the uh, the woman who'd been uh, dealing with us, uh, giving us our hotel rooms and this, that, and the other thing, she moved. She got bumped up, put a new woman in charge, and she's doing what she can for us. But I don't think she understands really what we are and, who, and what we need as much as we say that. Um, the, the rooms that we we have been in in the the uh, Marriott Convention Marriott uh, Hotel for about six or seven, eight years, uh, they got closed for renovation, and we got moved out to the Embassy Suites, which is to us, it appears to be off-site. They keep insisting, oh, no, that's still part of the convention. Uh, if you know what you're doing, you can get from the convention center to the embassy suites in about five minutes. But if you don't, it might take you 15, navigating yourself to the rooms we had. To me, it looked like we've been moved off-site, and I think our numbers showed that. Our numbers took a sharp drop, uh, and we started climbing our way back up with a lot of advertising. I put together our, uh, uh, our mailing list, our, e our large-scale email broadcast list about 12, 1,300 uh, email addresses on it. You've probably all gotten an email address from that. Um, uh, and uh, we try to send out about three or four a year just to try to keep – to remind people we're going to be somewhere against the possibility that, yeah, we'll be left out of the program book. We'll be left out of this or advertising is going to be down again. Um, but um, we, we've gotten stuffed into smaller and smaller spaces, smaller and smaller rooms. And it, uh, it reduces the um, experience, the player experience. So they don't, they don't tend to come back. They don't tell people to come back. Um, we're not considered to be guests anymore. We used to get 
uh, in addition to, th to three rooms to play our games in, we used to get four hotel, four double occupancy hotel rooms and two round trip tickets and $200 expenses each, uh, two round trip airline tickets. We, I gave up, you know, Dan, uh, when Dan dropped out, I said, I don't need the ticket at all. I don't need the money. I don't care about that. I just want us to get the hotel rooms for the staff. Uh, and it's, they're still getting cut down. Uh, Origins or Gen Con changed their policy so that they're not recognizing guests or whatever anymore. So we're just another we're just another gaming group in their opinion. So that means we have to justify the hotel rooms we're, we're getting given by a certain number of player hours, and we also need to get uh, we also get uh, have been encouraged that we need to tack on um, a surcharge so that the convention gets their eight dollars, we get four. And we'll get a check that also covers our part of our hotel rooms. So now we're struggling to try to pay for our own way at that convention. And, and, and the, uh, real, last the real pain in that is that, you know, we have staff come to the convention and some of us are nuts like Mark and I, you know, we're working 16 hour days, but we got staff that's working 12 hour days and they barely have time to get food and they barely have time to, to go check out the dealer hall or to play any other games. So, you know, the difficulty is you're going to get to a point where we won't have people crazy enough to come and work like a slave and then have to pay for it because that's what it's being turned into. And that's part of why Thank we you. continue to debate whether we should try to do our own events, but we really don't like the idea of trying to pass on to our players what it really costs to run a game because if you take into account all the things we print and all the prep that we do. And you don't say there's hourly rates, it's just materials. It costs us about $600 a convention for the stuff that we're printing up and, and producing. So that's on top of, you're now going to have to pay for hotel rooms and you pay for meals. And you do that with the people who are working with you. Uh, not everybody has the economics to do it or the desire to spend their whole weekend working hard and sometimes having fun because we see the, the antics of the players. Yeah. Well, and all because we have to generate a certain number of man hours in order to try to make ends meet. Uh, now last year, last year, Gen Con was a disaster numbers wise, uh, worst numbers we'd seen since I started to keep numbers in 2013. Uh, and I blame that largely on they removed, they moved us from the embassy suites where we were, trying to rebuild the following, I still didn't like it a whole lot, to um, the Lucas, Lucas Stadium rooms, and people had a hard time finding us, and with our signage was gone, whatever. Uh, it was we very, very problems very because they were happy about us putting signs in the hall because they had new rules on signage. And the other thing that was super killer is they put us in a room that was so small that I really think if OSHA had come by, they would have said, you're deafening people, you can't operate in this room. We had too many people in a very confined space. Well, very frustrating because we had, you know, we had you know, six, some, some, over 60 people in some of the crisis games at least, uh, whereas we looked around the rooms around us and they're, they're third occupied, they're empty for hours at a time and we can't, we can't spill over, we can't move into those rooms. Um, the answer for them is still no. Uh, this year, we would have been back in the embassy suites again. Uh, we're, we're solving a lot of these problems and learning now. La uh, uh, the last year, we were we stood to lose $800,000. And to their credit, they came through and they gave us far more um, uh, money for the man hours that we spent that we had a right to ask for. That might have been a mistake or might have been they're recognizing we talked NSDM into this and now they're getting screwed for it so we'll we'll step up that thousand dollars meant nothing to them but it would have been a disaster for us uh so i i got to give them credit that that they're they're trying in their own way um but it's still hard, still tough and the, um, the real challenge is that origins and gen con have become primarily businesses and they're not run by the hobbyists anymore so gen con is now the game of money and Origins is the game of how do they survive uh, in terms of having some kind of reputation and run a con. Because I don't think at any point they made a lot of money. They built a reserve in the John Ward gears because John was a really first-class grade A uh, penny pincher. But there were lots of things that didn't happen. And although he did some incremental improvements, they really aren't a, an event that's designed to make a profit. Uh, Gen Con's designed to make a profit, and it's all about profit. Unless you contribute to that now, it's a problem. 
Okay. Yeah. So anyway, Dragon Con is our only real success story. We, well, like escape velocity, but that's still rather, rather small potatoes. Dragon Con, our numbers are up, uh, and they're great. Uh, we're enjoying ourselves at Dragon Con. They like us. Uh, it's a bit of a trip for the for the guys from Ohio to come down to Atlanta, uh, but um, uh, we hope to ride that for as long as we can. Uh, no interest really in getting back to M HMGS conventions. Um, current issues: we we want to expand our educational venues. We think there's there's tremendous advantage in NSTM, our format, or especially our staff in terms of educating people. Uh, we want to get our numbers back up at Art Arge and try to rebuild. We want to survive at Gen Con, uh, and time will tell if this year would have worked. Uh, we're never going to know, but we'll try it. We'll try it again next. Try again what we did next year. Get back into the embassy suites because we had one a one large room and one breakout room there. At least we at least we could potent we, we put it we put together a 129 person game uh, there in uh, 2017. Uh, so hopefully that could have 2018. Well, hopefully that could have worked uh, in the one room. The one room wasn't was workable. I, I still would have liked three or four rooms, but I'm not sure where we're going to get back there again, except maybe a Dragon Con. Um, we want to build on our success at Dragon Con. Uh, we've been talking for a while about putting our own NSTM weekend, uh, probably somewhere between uh, Indianapolis and, and Chicago, and just getting a, um, a good-sized hotel where we can rent, rent a few rooms and cater it or not, people drive in or not, was it start Friday night, a, a whole lot of ideas. But there's a lot of work we have to do in terms of, yeah, how do we, we how do we charge, how do we put money together, how do we pay for the whole thing, uh, and uh, uh, see see where we want to go. We've and, certainly and got honestly, a lot of people who said they'd be interested in driving into a something they could they could reach you know, us a drive in two or three hours. We'd have lectures the night before, then uh, a short game in the morning and a long game in the afternoon, then more lectures at night, and anybody who wants to stick around the next morning, we'd have lectures too. I, I think we could have a lot of fun, but I, whether it's whether we're ever going to pay for ourselves, that's the, the big question. And and basically, um, the main reason that hasn't happened is bandwidth, because you know to do all the prep and to do all the polling and to try to sign people up is one more thing on top of all the other things we're doing, just trying to keep the wheels from falling off. Yep. And this, there, yeah, we're we're tinkering now with how do we play uh, our Cuban Missile Crisis game online. Yeah, that will learn us learn us some stuff about how we could more do a more general game. The NSTM, our Cuban Missile Crisis game is uh, is very structured and it's made uh, tailor made for some some type of online play. So that's why we're starting with that. But if we start that, we're looking at our we uh, we've run a couple of play tests with our Discord server, uh, and uh, it's looking very promising. But I don't think we're get, we're I'm not, we're not planning on submitting uh, a game for for uh, Gen Con, but we're planning on trying to do uh, uh, a, two, a multi cell Cuban Missile Crisis game for Dragon Con. Uh, we're assuming Dragon Con is going to be canceled. They haven't made the official announcement yet, but I can't see uh, putting that many people with that before there's a vaccine for this thing. That many people in a room. My wife's already told me that if if they don't cancel Dragon Con, you're not going anyway. So. Um, uh, for what it's worth, we're still on still on the docket for running at Dragon Con, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but and the, we, we are ready to step up and, and do an online game and online lectures. As we're going to be doing online lectures for Origins and Gen Con. Um, we're working more on the Cold War's 1980s game. We ran it once with the U.S. cell. We'll have a, we were planning on having a Soviet cell this summer, but there aren't going to be a convention this summer, so that's on that's on track. And uh, for what it's worth, I thought the one game we did run was pretty interesting. Uh, my my personal experience is that we should, instead of expanding into an entirely new game, we should be perfecting the ones we've got or evolving the ones we've got. But as somebody, one of our staff wanted to work it, so I said, sure. I'm not going to say you can't. And we, and if you have a working game, we'll find a place to put it. Um, Science fiction and futuristic scenarios, they're, they're not really our brand, but they're wildly popular, especially at, at Dragon Con and uh, um, uh, Escape Velocity. So, uh, we're, so we're continuing with those. Um, economic play and policy and budgets, we're always debating what we want to do as far where we want to go as far as that goes. Yeah. It, we could talk uh, about, yeah, you want to get your economy up, but then if we don't bring the economy up, 
uh, in some way, reward the players, give them the feedback. Uh, are, are we really playing economics or not? I think we know how to play economics without a policy and budget. Uh, there's no real way to reward the players and policy and budget. I just thought drag the game's game down in terms of slowing it down. Uh, and in a four hour game, you really can't do that too much. But we're getting feedback from some of our context inventions that uh, maybe maybe uh, Americans' uh, attention spans are getting shorter, but there's more interest in saying, can you make it shorter now? More two-hour games. Um, uh, economics and uh, uh, another issue is, do we want the great power games? Are people more interested in playing the U.S., Russia, China, Iran, these large nations, uh, there's been a lot of interest when we put together a Taiwan cell or an Indonesian cell or a, a Vietnam Vietnam cell, uh, but where where we want to go with that is always is a question we're doing. We've been afraid to run a contemporary U.S. cell in the current political climate with the polarization of our body politic. Uh, that people are it's going to get it's going to hit too close to home. The way we've been doing U.S. cells recently, we've been projecting a year forward into the future, announcing who won the 2020 election and saying that's a fait accompli and let's not rehash it and then moving on from there. Um, and so the two hour, uh, sorry. So in terms of our future, I mean, what what we think this means is that we're going to be exploring online games probably for the next six to 12 months because it's our net assessment that you're sure for sure not going to have a live game uh, this, this this calendar year. Uh, and we may not end up most of next calendar year. Um, that's why we're really looking at stuff online and we've been beta testing stuff on a Discord server, which seems to be very promising. But honestly, we have a couple of shortcomings there. One is because NSDM is a many-to-many -many relationship, everybody can talk to anybody. Uh, doing the, tr the communications traffic management is difficult. So where uh, Discord and these other tools work well is when you have small group dynamics for most of what you're doing. So Cuban Missile Crisis works because you've got basically three teams of 13 people who talk amongst themselves and then send messages out. Um, we will probably, at our next test, um, add more cells and ask for more volunteers because uh, we ran about nine people in a uh, U.S.-only beta test. Uh, the other problem we have with going to full games is because of that many-to-many -many relationship, and we're still trying to figure out how to implement something like action sheets in a practical way online without making it really cumbersome. Those are some real shortcomings right now in what we're seeing because essentially no ad hoc way for people to talk and say, you, you, and you, I want to talk to the Soviet minister of culture and the, the Chinese uh, political police and, you know, the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Commerce can't find one another. Nonetheless, go to a private place to talk. And we've come up with a couple of workarounds, but they're all clumsy. The, the second killer is that whole issue of how do we implement um, the action seat. So we're probably going to look at uh, team type games more. So we might go to a conventional mega game like the new ones where they're stove piped and you do your group planning here and then you do certain functional things. But that really hasn't been our brand. And that would be a major change if we have to go that way. Um, the other thing that we're, we're looking at is we're going to keep our foot in with seminars and lectures. So we're going to record them, and that's why we set up the YouTube channel. So that that's the sort of the future right now. Um, there's not a heck of a lot more, and we're now like seven minutes over time. So we probably should be closing do, out. Do want to do want to acknowledge some of the last chats to send. Uh, Rebecca, yeah, thank thank you. If uh, I, again, I doubt Dragon Con's going to happen, and I doubt my wife's going to let me go if it does. But uh, appreciate the offer for dinner one night. But by all means. Uh, we'll take you up with that whenever the whenever it's possible. Well, when uh, Zachary finishes in Columbus, she can take me out, and I will take a picture of the meal and send it to you, and you can digitally enjoy it. That that will be very satisfying, Merle. Thank you for uh, very considerate, Zachary. Yes, uh, Escape Velocities. We've been there twice. It's always been a positive experience. I've uh, we've we've enjoyed the heck out of it, and uh, we hope to build on it. Um, uh, Michael, uh, yeah. Uh, by all means, I uh, wouldn't mind volunteering the digital side to Penance Michael and uh, 
uh, Jeff, if you want to try to take part in their Cuban Missile Crisis beta, by all means, um, will uh, Merle please put something on Facebook to that people can sign up for that? Yeah, the next um, time we do that, we will be we'll, we'll need, people through the we'll, Facebook. We'll need page. more. Yeah, we're and uh, SharePoint, Chris. Yeah, SharePoint. Yeah, we're. I'm still trying to figure out how we want to tell Gen Con we're going to be giving our lectures lectures online. I think we're probably going to be using Zoom, but I don't know enough about it myself yet, and I have to get smart on it. Uh, uh, we're probably, probably going to be doing lectures on on Steam, StreamYard, which is what we're doing now because it has some features for banners and other things, uh, and the price is comparable. the 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 advantage of Zoom is you can have like a hundred people and see 48 of them. The limit right now is two pages of pictures with people divided into Hollywood squares, but it's still the problem of they can't talk to one another effectively. So we're probably going to have to use some mixed media process if we have more than a half a dozen people involved. So what SharePoint, does, what StreamYard does for us is we can put logos and banners and do previews and editing that's a little bit better. And nobody has to download any software. That's the real plus. And while we're doing this, if we set it up right, it would be recording to YouTube properly, as well as streaming on Facebook. Um, you know, so that that's one of the real advantages because you can broadcast it out to multiple channels pretty fast uh, and without a lot of work. So... StreamYard is probably going to be our lecture tool, and we may or may not go into other stuff for uh, games. Right now, we're looking at Discord because it's free, it's programmable, we've got some people that have some skill, and that's helped us. Um, that may not be our final result, but for now, that's probably what we're going to do for the next six months, unless somebody comes along with a lot more knowledge and skill. So the, the, the two things I always want to do at the end of any NSDM event one is to say, if anybody wants to work long, long hours for no money, you know, send us a note, and we'll be glad to put you on staff. Because the way it works is, if you get along with people and can have civil conversations about controversial things, and you do work, we will find a place for you. The other thing is, if any of you know somebody like Bill Gates, who's a great philanthropist and got a lot of money, it wouldn't take much every year to finance what we need to have to run all our NSDM events and not lose money as individuals. Because, I mean, somebody comes along with five or $10,000, we could go to every event that we're going to now. And if they do 20, we could start thinking like, fuck Mr. Fuller and the Model UN stuff, you know. But, <laughs> you know, just so everybody knows, we are more than welcome to have more people join our group. You have oh, and, uh, one, one, last, one last Dan story. Uh, uh, Dan, Dan passed away on January 18th, 2016. That was Martin Luther King Day. As conservative as he was, uh, you know, Dan, Dan always thought Martin Luther King was a KGB agent, <laughs> uh, but not really. But he, 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 he would stress how much the, the, all these radical movements in the 60s were, in fact, we're being funded by the KGB. We know that. That doesn't denigrate, uh, remove what uh, what these people did. But but uh, I was I had back actually that was a Monday. I brought his his kids down on Friday. Uh, he had been in a dementia ward at that point for uh, for for many years, uh, and they hadn't had a chance to see him. So I said, well, so I drove them down from that they picked them up uh, outside New York and drove them down to Maryland. They they were able to spend a lot of Friday afternoon. Now of course they're you know, they're young men, and they uh, uh, there's the the uh, the hospice nurses were saying it might it was going to be days to a couple of weeks. They weren't really sure, uh, so I put the boys back on a bus Saturday afternoon to head back to New York City, and I stuck I spent around spent the weekend with Ruth trying to get get arrangements made for whatever for what we knew was inevitable at that point, and I was ready to drive Sunday drive back up to Connecticut where I live. Um, and we, I went to, went to, went to services with her. It was always funny showing up uh, at, uh, at, ch at, with her at Dan's church because I kept getting these, these second looks. I, I don't think Dan and I look alike, but everybody says we do. Uh, I know we're brothers. So yeah, we do. So I, a lot of people were in fact, look, is Dan back? Is Dan back? No, they, they look at me and say, no, he's, he's not fat enough to be Dan. <laughs> but, uh, 
but at any rate, we then had uh, had lunch with a, a lady that uh, from church uh, that had been my car was packed ready to go to Connecticut that had been very very helpful to Ruth in the the last few months as things were were reaching a crisis phase with Dan uh, and um, as we were leaving. Uh, I was getting, I was, Ruth was going to get her car, go home or go see Dan. I was going to get my car, go home to Connecticut, start the, you know, eight plus hour drive. Uh, and then she got the call from the hospice nurses saying it looked like the final slide had started. Uh, at that point, it's just afternoon on Sunday and we go there and we spend, spend, the, spend a few hours with Dan and Ruth sends some messages out and people start coming, coming in knowing that this is getting close to the end. Um, so toward early evening, uh, we're looking at Ruth and I taking, you know, me taking the mid watch while she, she spends the next few hours here. I'll go home. I'll go back to her place, get some sleep. Then I'll come back and take the mid watch. And, uh, I got the word. She actually, I was getting ready to leave and head in and she, she said, said the word that he'd passed away 18 minutes after midnight on Martin Luther King day. I'm sure that would have driven him nuts. <laughs> But I tell people he just didn't want to he just didn't want to pass away on a Sunday um, as religious as he was. So um, we got there was you know, we, Ruth is the kind of person to look for signs that he's actually communicating with her. And in fact, she got home. I was up. I, I put uh, I was getting ready to go back, go back in. So I just put on Star Wars. I know he would have liked uh, like me watching Star Wars is one of one of his legacies, one of his favorite. He was he was a Star Wars fan. I'm I'm usually more of a Star Trek guy myself. But there was a phone there was a message on Ruth's answering machine um and there was no there was no voice. Some somebody called, you know, like a few minutes after Dan passed away and it didn't the phone didn't ring. Uh, but there was a message and it was blank and so people are saying, uh, people are wondering, you know, we, is is that him actually calling and say he's he's arrived, things are fine, he's gotten together with my dad, with our dad and with our mom, and uh, um, and he'll see us, he'll see us uh, in the course of the course of time in some other place. So anyway, that's that's the last Dan story. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us, and hopefully this will. Uh be uh, an entryway for a lot of folks in the future, and we'll probably improve on this and do some jazzed up versions. But what you'll see next are seminars that we do for Gen Con, so that now there'll be a record of the stuff that we produce. So thanks again, and we're going to sign off. So thanks so much. Okay. Bye now.